one blue. All right. I don't know if we're quite streaming yet or not. Now we're streaming. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Thersites the Historian. I'm joined tonight by Sean Chick. We are doing part two of the Second Punic War, this time looking at the Carthaginian commanders. For those of you who are watching in the future, just keep in mind that I have a prior video about the subject where I talk about the general conditions that Carthaginian generals operated under. So make sure that you watch that before this video if you are watching this after the live stream has aired. But in the meantime, we'll be talking about 25 different Carthaginian commanders. I advertised 20, but I decided to give you some bonus material. Now, uh, Sean, would you like to do some housekeeping? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do a, uh, another book uh, giveaway tonight, but we want to uh, say that because the uh, mail rates have really gone up, we'll have to have like uh, $25 minimum for like the total that we get in to mail a book out. But I've got a large selection of pretty decent books here uh, over at my place. I'm trying to lessen the library because I might have to be moving, you know? Uh, none of these are bad books, just that, you know, you're kind of like, hey, I haven't opened you up in five or ten years, so maybe I should say bye, right? Because books are fucking, they're, 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 not easy to, they're not easy to move. They're a pain in the ass, right? Yeah, especially when they're boxed together, which is why I had a friend who helped him move, and apparently he didn't know what a book box was because he thought you could just use a medium or large-sized box, fill it up with books, and carry it with no problems. And yeah. uh, that was some dumb shit. <laughs> and I was sore for a while. Anyway. Box. <laughs> yeah, not a good uh, idea, guys. If you're yeah. moving books, use a small box. How is the uh, how's the audio balance on this one? I, ha I have fooled around my mic settings. Um, uh, It sounds to okay to me, but uh, I'll have to ask the audience, I guess. All right. I, I had to do a show on the... Um, on Paper Wars, on, on the uh, Compass Games uh, page a few days ago, and I think I should be fine. Okay. And also, Sean, can you keep track of uh, Super Chats? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, my brother, uh, we're taking his bad movie reviews, and I'm putting them on a blog called Dancing Sandwiches. That's what he wanted to call it. And I'd like to put a link there sometime or promote that sometime because you know, I know you like bad movies as well, you know. Yeah. And just you know, people check them out. I mean, they're they're well written, funny reviews. But that's pretty much all I got for housekeeping. What you got? Um, not much. I guess for next week we're planning on doing a call-in show. So basically, what we didn't do this past week because of technical issues. <clears throat> yeah. So that will be next week. Uh, just a free flow. Uh, people can call in, ask their questions, hang out. So, that is the plan. Uh, Sean, you're getting some feedback that people are saying that you're echoing and that you're sounding robotic. I'm not sure why that would be the case. Okay, so am I echoing right now and sounding robotic? Because yeah, I'm not hearing an echo on my end. We already did the Roman well, Commanders. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure the stuff's fine. I'm trying to plan out the audio to make sure we don't have too much of an imbalance, you know. Um. All right. Anyway, Sean, you sound like you're away from the mic. How do I sound right now? Are you pretty good? Okay. Um. I think you should be okay. okay. I think it's mostly because I don't you use the audio on your laptop speakers? No, no, I use a uh, a globe oh. that uh, you told me to buy. Okay. Yeah, I use a snowball. All right. Um Okay. Yeah, it might just be that uh, sometimes the connection's not as good as other times and it can cause a little bit of distortion. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Okay. But well, you want to go ahead and start off with uh, these Carthaginian bad boys? Sure. We'll start off with uh, 
someone you might have imagined would be first, and that is none other than Hannibal Barca. Hannibal is the oldest son of Hamilcar Barca, the great hero of the First Punic War. His father, Hamilcar, is the guy who not only won some battles against the Romans late in the First Punic War, when things were looking pretty dark for Carthage, he then went on to be the hero of the Truceless War against all the mercenaries Carthage couldn't afford to pay. And now that Carthage was saddled with all kinds of debt that the Romans had imposed on them, it was Hamilcar who proposed going to Spain to seize control of the mines there and repay the debt to Rome while also building back Carthage's base of power. So Hannibal was someone who came from literally the most powerful family in Carthage at this time. Not only did they have a lot of military authority, but their position within the Senate was extraordinarily strong, largely due to the fact that they're the paymasters of the state, for all practical intents and purposes. And that's saying a lot, given how wealthy North Africa is in terms of agriculture, at least Tunisia itself. So, Hannibal had lived in Spain from the age of about nine onward. And he had grown up in the camp. He's someone who was a natural leader. He seems to have had a great deal of charisma. He was highly educated. He was a Hellenophile, meaning that he was obsessed with Greek culture. And he also was one of the few people who had the ability to really appreciate what each unit in his army could potentially do and what the different leaders under him were capable of pulling off. So this is someone who, by the time he takes command of Barsid Spain at the age of 26 in the year 221 already has a wealth of experience and he is extremely well positioned to put his talents to great use. Um, Hannibal is best known for his crossing of the Alps. That is one of his better known feats. There have been some people who have critiqued his move. Um, He clearly did lose a lot of men crossing through Gaul and then over the Alps. And that is a somewhat fair criticism. However, it's worth observing that the strategy, the basic strategy of taking the fight to Rome and trying to spark rebellions in Italy, I think was really the only option that he had, or at least the only plausible option that might result in victory. In my primer video, I argued that if Hannibal and the Carthaginians had stood on the defensive, that Rome would have defeated them just by hurling men at them repeatedly. By actually going to Italy, you break up that manpower horde that Rome has. Or at least you threaten it enough that they don't overwhelm you in your own homeland with hordes of men. So Hannibal's fundamental strategy was sound. Just getting through the Alps itself was no small feat. A lot of people including some ancients, underestimated the feat because they're only really familiar with the Alps people often cross, which are the Alps nearer to the coast that are not nearly as steep. Hannibal went through some of the densest parts that are very difficult in terms of the footing and even managed to get a couple elephants through. Hey, didn't wasn't there a guide? I, I, I think I remember reading something, but there was uh, possibly one of the guides like led them down one of the worst paths, though, like he was paid by the Romans or something, like a spy, if you will, it, um, Did it's I possible. I don't okay. know. I've never heard that personally. But I imagine yeah, well, the, I, a lot of the problem was that some of the guides were disloyal, not so much loyal to Rome, but just disloyal in general, because he got led into a couple of ambushes. In the Alps? Yeah, he got ambushed a couple times. He also had to do some fighting as he was crossing through Gaul, especially when he was trying to cross the Rhone River. And we'll get into one oh, of yeah, the generals like that helped him there. Gotcha. Uh, so, yeah, he, he basically lost, between leaving men behind and casualties and desertion, he lost about half his army from the time he left Spain until he arrived in Italy. Damn. But with that core of men, he was able to uh, recruit new men and also spark rebellions and add to his ranks and keep this core going for about 15 years. And that in itself is an extraordinary feat especially since he received very little help from Carthage, as we'll discuss. There's only one real batch reinforcements that he got, and I believe it was less than 5,000 men. And that was just a one-time shot. Uh, But it did at least give him more Numidians, which is what he really needed. Numidian cavalry were priceless. So anyway, um, 
Hannibal, of course, is best known for his early victories. Tychinus, the Trebia, Lake Trasimene, Cannae. Uh, you can argue about which ones you think are the most impressive. Personally, I actually think the Battle of Lake Trasimene is the most interesting, where he, he literally just uh, set up an ambush right in front of the enemy commander, and it still worked. Um, Kanai, of course, is still studied at West Point and at military academies around the world. He achieved a double envelopment against a superior force, not by overwhelming the flanks, but rather by collapsing his own middle in what amounts to a controlled demolition because he knew his men would retreat. And he also stationed himself and his best officers in the middle to make sure that while they did buckle, they didn't break. So this is way harder than a traditional double envelopment where you just smash the enemy flanks and uh, swoop around. But he did that at the same time with this cavalry. So a very complex maneuver, but extraordinarily well executed. And clearly the men who helped him must have had some talent, because their tasks were all pretty difficult. But without the guiding influence of Hannibal, we'll see that as those various wing commanders went off on their own, they had way less success. And my previous video also pointed out that for Hannibal and for others... Uh, or for Hannibal especially, it was easy to figure out what each unit could do and to establish rapport with all of the different nationalities. He spoke multiple languages, very charismatic, but most of his officers were not as talented, lacked the charisma, did not have his foresight, um, did not have his sense of terrain, his sense of tactics. So an army like that that's composed of many parts on, in the uh, under the guidance of Hannibal is extraordinarily deadly, maybe more deadly than a more uniform force. But under any kind of average general, such a force will have a lot of trouble against the Romans. So, um, I'm not sure what else anybody would like me to say about Hannibal. I mean, I think we all kind of know that Hannibal's pretty <laughs> good. Um, <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah, we... yeah, go ahead. No, 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 you, you, know, you finish up, you finish up. Um, he also had a couple of other victories after Cannae that often get ignored. He destroyed a couple of smaller Roman armies led by Praetors. I think he had one in 212 and another at 210, both at Herdonia. So the same city, he destroyed two small armies twice. Um, he had led an ambush that resulted in the death of uh, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, one of the greatest Roman commanders of the war. He captured the city of Capua, and held it for a year or two. He captured the city of Tarentum, even after the war was starting to turn. He held on to Brutium, which is basically the southwestern corner of Italy, an area that had a lot of Greek settlers. He was a master of propaganda. He appealed to both the Gallic people in the north by uh, trying to play to their want for independence. He also posed as Hercules for the Greeks of the south. He did a lot of things very, very well. While Hannibal is not necessarily the most successful commander in history because uh, he didn't win the war, spoiler, I think <laughs> in terms of skill, he's definitely up there. And in that list of great captains that only includes five or six people, he definitely deserves his spot. So uh, those are my thoughts on Hannibal in brief. Uh, what would you well, like to add? One? Well, who are the other ones listed in the great captains typically along with Hannibal? It's oh, usually, great? It's usually uh, Frederick the Great, Napoleon, Alexander, Hannibal, and I believe, who was the other one? Um, maybe it was either Scipio Africanus or Wellington or somebody like that. Um, not Caesar? It might have been Caesar, actually. I think it was Caesar, now that you yeah. mention it. Yeah, I mean, like, he, I mean, he's Hannibal's always mentioned in that top ten list, and along with Napoleon, he's he's one of the two commanders who are like they they lost their war, but um, you know everybody recognizes, of course, their the great military talents naturally. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, there, it's, it's I I I'll ask you this though, I, I've heard it said that uh, they that they, they that one historian one time said that he thought that Hannibal was the man who started the idea of strategy, really. Because it wasn't just the idea of, I've got to beat the enemy, but he had like a plan to beat them, if you will. And I'm not sure if I agree with that, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, necessarily. Um, I don't know. I'm not 100% certain on that in that regard. Um, 
Because I guess the theory with that would be that Alexander just kind of rolled into Persia and was like, let me go fuck some shit up, right? Well, yeah, I mean, because there are, there are some moralizing authors later, like Plutarch, who sort of believed that, that Alexander was just following his destiny or his nature. But if you really study his campaigns and look at where he marched, he was always within reach of a river, which means that he was paying close attention to logistics, and there was a lot of art in what he did. Um, well, he, he most certainly would have to. His army is small, and he's he's getting deeper into territory. He has to really worry about things like logistics and supplies. So naturally, you know, I mean, you're not going to pull that off just by running around. It's the same thing with Genghis Khan. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like trying to attribute a firm beginning to something like strategy is probably very difficult to do, if not impossible. Um, the word itself is derived from the Greek. Uh, there's strategia, which means generalship. There's strategos, general. So that's where we get the word from. And actually, Pericles in the, the early, the late 430s had a strategy for the Peloponnesian War. And Themistocles okay. had a strategy for the Persian War. But I, I doubt those are the first times that there were strategies. I mean, uh, I, I, I doubt it as well. I just wanted to mention it to you because I'd heard it and I was pretty sure it was wrong, like 90% sure, but I wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, when I, I mean, heard it, it was one of those things I was like, well, that's a bold claim, you know? Yeah, I think that maybe if they said something along the lines of grand strategy, because he's sort of, sort of directing, in a way, an entire war effort just by his action, although, as we'll see, he did not have full control. So. Yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, it's really it, some of those concepts are really hard to pin down in terms of exactly when they came to full fruition. Honestly, the I'm gonna go ahead and say this though: the, the commander that Hannibal most reminds me of is Marlborough. Um, oh, really? Yeah, the, he, he hear me out on this one. Both of them are tactically very good, although they do tend to kind of follow the same plan, right? They both commanded polyglot armies. Uh, you know, Marlborough's army wasn't, I mean, the British were a core of the army, naturally. There was also Dutch, German, Prussian contingent. Of course, he had Eugenius Savoy, who had the Austrians with him as well. So, you know, Marlborough's army was very much multinational. You know, multi-ethnic, I guess you would say, much like Hannibal's. Uh, they both had strong political lobbies that were for and against them back home that could support them, but also undermine them at key times. Hmm. Especially as Marlborough's campaigns go on, he's receiving less and less support from uh, Britain, especially after the uh, Battle of Malplaquet. Um, in addition to that, both of them were had a reputation for, and I know with I know in ancient times it's kind of a stretch to begin with, but I do know that that Hannibal's men probably one of the things that that seems to have hurt them was that they had to live off the land, and that meant plunder. And I do think that kind of hurt him in recruiting. Uh, soldiers and winning people over. Right. Uh, and Marlboro, uh, yeah, he definitely, uh, I mean, Marlboro, not quite as much in that regard, but Marlboro was infamous for having essentially a pillaging campaign in Bavaria. Mm. But anyway, um, and uh, I think there was another thing I wanted to equate with the two of them that they, they remind each other a lot. Um, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, both very charismatic and able to get a lot out of their uh their generals understood their commanders also be able to get a lot of other men understand their strengths and weaknesses of the various units in their army definitely more so with hannibal though and both very good at diplomacy that's something they keep about marlboro because if i'm comparing marlboro to wellington for instance people uh i think wellington is actually much more impressive tactically actually tactically one of the most impressive generals of all time but wellington wasn't actually a very great good diplomat you know, he, he didn't really get along with the Spanish generals, which I'm not entirely blaming him for necessarily. But Marlboro really showed a knack for diplomacy as well, and so did Hannibal. So yes. I, I do, I, I do, and and also uh, they arguably both lost their wars, although Marlboro now is dramatically. Now I say lost wars. Let me explain. Marlboro was removed from command, and then Britain signed a separate peace, which was slightly to their advantage. But Marlborough wasn't just thinking how it would be to Britain's advantage. He was thinking how it would be to the advantage also of Britain's allies, such as Austria. So Marlborough was doubly upset with Britain settling the peace the way they did in the War of the Spanish Succession. Mm -hmm. And the degree to which the War of the Spanish Succession is a French victory or defeat is still debated to this day. 
I favor the conclusion that it was ultimately a draw. Um, yeah. Along with the, like the War of the Austrian Succession, the same thing. I view both those conflicts as being almost textbook definitions of a draw for most parties. Of course, in the case of Austrian Succession, uh, Prussia gained an advantage. And in the case of the Spanish Succession, we would say the British gained an advantage. But Marlborough was not happy about that at all. And so I really do feel I I, I feel like there's um, there's some de- there's some interesting parallels there, and some of that is probably, you know, similar personalities probably in many ways, but also just you know coincidence if you will. But it, it's it's a nice little comparison. It's just something I just thought of as you were talking about him. I was thinking about him, especially in terms of his diplomatic skill and commanding this polyglot army, and being a tactical um, being tactically very good. I wouldn't necessarily say genius though. Because, like, once again, I think Marlborough and Hannibal both tried, seems like they tried to do the same battle over and over again, if you will. <laughs> Although, um, Hannibal had a few different variations. I mean, because his basic idea was to throw the enemy into disarray by creating a distraction. Because men would wear helmets that would cover up a lot of their field of vision. And also men yeah. packed in formations would have a lot of trouble figuring out the degree of a threat that emerged from behind them. So he could put a fairly small number of men who weren't literally capable of overwhelming them in the rear, and that could spark a panic. And all the casualties in a battle happen when a force breaks, pretty much. At least a lot of them do. Uh, yeah, so this warfare, Han- yes. Hannibal was masterful at doing that. He also, I, I think I read somewhere, I have not been able to verify this, that Hannibal was the first commander to make extensive use of of a battlefield reserve that before this it was very common to commit all your men initially and fight it out but Hannibal often kept a reserve interesting and can I think can you think of anybody else well I mean I guess the Persians kept reserves but they also had massive massive army well yeah massive also the, the reserve was usually the immortals who were also the king's personal unit um, yeah but yeah so with Hannibal he does innovate somewhat and I think if you look at, say, his strategy at Lake Trasimene, that's the biggest departure. Because the other ones, he kind of tries to do the thing where he achieves some sort of shock or surprise to break the enemy and then presses the advantage. Yeah. Um, and then Kanai was also a bit of a deviation in the sense that he didn't have a force that really created a massive distraction. So it was just um, creating... It, it, creating a false sense of victory and then turning it on its head, which is a different thing altogether. But with Hannibal, it was always very psychological. I see. Um, uh, it makes perfect sense. No, no, it it, it yeah. makes perfect sense. I, I do, I, I think it goes back to the diplomacy, though, as well, as ability to know his men. Hannibal is, I think, one of your first commanders, at least ones we have on record, who really understands the psychology of warfare. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and is using it to his advantage. It's also interesting because we talked about Scipio Africanus last time, and he and Hannibal are rivals. They do they act very similarly when it comes to their approach to war. Scipio fought against Hannibal as a legate, and so then when he went to Spain, he basically used a Hannibalic strategy and also some more Hannibalic tactics on the field as well. So in many ways, he was the chief disciple of Hannibal. And, of course, they famously fought at Zama, which, as I'll show later, was actually probably won by another subordinate who started out on the Carthaginian side but switched before Zama. We'll get to that when we get there. Anyway, um, after the war, they also shared a very similar experience politically. Hannibal stayed behind in Carthage. He became a major player after he entered politics in the 190s, and his popularity was such that no one could touch him. So what they did is they went to Rome and they started spreading rumors about how Hannibal was planning to renew the war or something like that. But most of Hannibal's reforms were actually fairly populist by the standards of the time. He was a man of the people, at least at this point. So he was trying to build things that would benefit the common populace of Carthage. So of course the landed class was pretty pissed off about that. Um, That's what got him exiled ultimately. In exile, he then becomes a mercenary general for a number of client kings. And one of them, of course, is Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire. At the Battle of Magnesia, when Rome and the Seleucids went to war, 
The expectation was that there would be a Scipio versus Hannibal round two, but both men were absent from the battle. It was ultimately Scipio's younger brother, Asiaticus, taking on Antiochus, and the Romans won. But, um, yeah, so Scipio was sick, and then Hannibal was commanding ships somewhere. Hannibal, as a naval commander, was also a bit of an innovator because he decided to once again play to psychology, and what he did is he put little catapults on his ships and he would hurl over pots full of snakes. Huh. And he won a small victory at sea doing that. Um, ultimately, he was hounded by his political opponents in the Romans, and he committed suicide at the age of 64 with his family. Uh, somewhere in Asia while he was trying to flee from the king who had hired him but was now arresting him to try to win brownie points with Rome. And also in 183, Scipio died. He was a little younger, 50-something, but um, he also had really gotten fed up with Roman politics because his opponents were constantly attacking <laughs> him and attacking his family members and allies. So um, actually, they these were both great war heroes who... Were not very, who were beloved by the populace, but were absolutely despised by large segments of the ruling class because they saw them as rivals. Yeah. Anyway, so I think it's safe to say what Hannibal's ranking should be. Clearly, kind of average, kind of a C. Fuck that man, he's an F. Yeah, I mean, I think he's, I think he's overrated. Yeah, he's, he lost. He's a loser. He's a loser. He's a loser. All right. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, it's, it's kind of it's kind of ridiculous. I love those books that people try to write. Well, they'll take somebody who's obviously really good and then talk about, you know, Alexander was actually a great failure. The guy sucked. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you got him for a lot of guys. You get him for Napoleon. Um, you know, Lee's a popular one right now as well. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be somebody. I mean, I guess I guess it's a way to make a name for yourself. I mean, I will say there there was one very critical appraisal I read of Frederick the Great that I think actually made really good points. You know, um, I do ultimately view Frederick as a great commander, but one of the most erratic of the great commanders, along with Julius Caesar. Yeah, Caesar, I would argue, is not a very good strategist. Um, he's an excellent tactician, and of course, he was really good at winning over his men. But strategically, he was not nearly as good as say Pompey. Yeah, I can agree with that. I mean, that's the thing, though. All these guys have strengths and weaknesses, for sure. Uh, you know, if if, um, if Hannibal had any weakness, maybe he was a bit... I mean, you mentioned tactical innovations, um, but maybe he stuck a little too much to plan. Of course, what are we saying? The Romans had the same plan every time. You know, jam up the middle, right? Yeah, I uh, mean, I don't, I don't know if Hannibal tried encirclement in every battle, though. I think he only did it where right. he saw an opening and he had the commanders and the Numidians and all the elements he would need. Now, his, when we get to his brother, we'll see that this man was obsessed with trying to recreate Kanai and fucked it up. Yeah, well, uh, so many people have tried to recreate Kanai. I mean, uh, the, 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 the Schlieffen plan w actually wasn't Kanai, it was an overload flank, but... Uh, Schlieffen himself was obsessed with the Battle of Cannae. Yeah, I mean, uh, Scipio recreated Cannae in Spain at Ilipa about 10 years later, but his plan was much, simple, much simpler. What he did is he just smashed the Carthaginian flanks and then marched their rear and encircled them. So his plan was, I have better troops, I don't have to get too fancy with this. And before the battle, after they had been squaring off for a few days, Scipio was giving a false impression of how he would deploy in the battle to make sure that the enemy put their quality troops in the middle. So then he put his quality troops in the wings at the last minute, initiated the battle, smashed on the wings, and circled and destroyed. So Scipio's plan was way simpler, but he did the same thing, which shows that this is someone who understood the lesson of Kanai and was not a slave to the battle. Well, as we all know, uh, the Americans pulled off Kanai at the Battle of Cowpens with uh, Daniel Morgan. Uh, he had that complicated plan where the militia would like fire one or two volleys and then retreat, yeah. you know, bringing Tarleton in, and then they came around the flanks. I mean, brilliantly done. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, for every, I mean, I, I know there's lots of failed canines, but there's also, like we're saying right now, there's also people who've actually pulled it off for sure. You know. Yeah, uh, and that's the difference between somebody who can look at a battle and understand how to adapt it, sort of see the principles behind it, 
and then someone who is just, for lack of a better term, a poser, who's just cosplaying. <laughs> a fanboy. Yeah, it's just a yeah, fanboy. Really cool. I'd want to try to do that myself, man. And then he probably meets him before bro. the battle. I'm about to canai you. <laughs> this sounds like a sh- this sounds like a really bad like wrestling promo, right? Yeah, it sounds like something they would do, and especially those really shitty modern wrestling promotions like AEW. He hit the canai. He hit the canai. Oh shit! He's gonna go for the co- the cover. <laughs> All right. Yeah, of, co- of course, Hannibal's an ass. He's this impressive general, and I think what really. Uh, be, I mean, beyond his success and all the good things we're talking about, it should always be kept in mind that this is Rome's boogeyman for hundreds of years. Yes, he literally is the boogeyman of Rome. Uh, when parents are trying to frighten their children, they use the phrase Hannibal is at the gates to reference the time, I believe it's in 215 or so, and also again in 212, where he tried to pretend that he was marching on Rome to attack it in order to distract the Romans from their siege operations at Capua. And uh, the the idea being Hannibal, if you don't behave yourself, Hannibal's going to come and kill you or abduct you or whatever. Yeah. Although it's interesting, yeah. like I said, on a personal level, Hannibal apparently was a very charming guy and had lots of friends and admirers. And an eye patch. And an eye patch. And uh, he also liked to quote Greek plays. Oh, cool. Do we know if there's any playwright that he was particularly fond particularly fond of? I want to say it's Euripides, but I don't remember where I read that. Um, he also had yes. about three or four different Greek biographers who followed him around, and th- those are actually most of the sources that we have, ultimately, if you traced it back, in terms of where the information came from about him yeah, so, and his plans. So, one last question. How do you... Do you how, how, how fond are you of that story where his father makes him, like, swear vengeance against Rome. Uh, it sounds like a nice poetic invention. I seriously doubt that happened. See, I think it happened, but doesn't necessarily mean that's why he did it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, I think I think his... I don't know if his father would have hated Rome as much as, as many of his contemporaries because his father gained fame beating the Romans... And his country turned to him because he was the one guy who had the ability to get shit done. Because Carthage was in a bad state by the end of the First Punic War. And then Hamilcar Barca gave it whatever small victories it was getting. And then he saved them from the mercenaries. Yeah, I've, I've heard the truceless war was pretty uh, savage. Am I correct on yes, that? Yes, uh, lots of crucifixions. Actually, the Carthaginians pretty either invented the crucifixion or they brought it over from the Assyrians... At any rate, uh, they were the ones who gave it to the Romans. And that was how they dealt with slaves. And so when they captured all of the mercenaries who did not surrender, they crucified the men they defeated. And left them out to die of exposure. (sighs) And also during that war, it was called the Truceless War because there there was no quarter given by either side. Straight I, I up imagine massacres. so, the name of the Truceless War, you know? That, yeah. Damn, that's sad. <laughs> so, it's pretty gruesome right. shit. Now well, on... Want to move, move on to our next chap? Our next man is Hasdrubal Barca. He is the second son of Hamilcar, the younger brother of Hannibal. He's about two years younger or so. And Wait, wait, wait. One sec. Well, I'm sorry, one sec before you go on. We're getting a lot of comments on this one. We want to answer some super chats real quick. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just realized, I just looked over, I was like, man, we're getting a lot of uh, discussion tonight, you know? So let's do a few of these so that we don't lose anything. All right. Uh, so, uh, Nerve V Maker uh, with uh, $10. Thank you very much. Uh, what are Sean's thoughts on the historian Alan C. Guzella, who's the author of Faithful Lightning and Gettysburg, The Last Invasion? He seems popular in the neoconservative crowd. He does. He's involved in that magazine that's name I can't remember right now. It's up with the Claremont Institute. Uh, I've never read his books. I know that he's a big, big, big Abraham Lincoln fan. And I mention that because Abraham Lincoln's place within conservatism is one of the more debated places, I would say. There's a variety of historians 
and thinkers and lunatics <laughs> who are the libertarian persuasion who absolutely despise Abraham Lincoln and there are other ones, other conservatives who say, no, Lincoln's a big hero. Uh, one thing people might point to is the fact that Lincoln is a civic nationalist, which he is to the bone, I would say. Um, so no, I, I can't give a comment on him. I can only say though that I do know from what I have read of his books that his love of Lincoln means that his history of Gettysburg is one of the most anti-Mead histories that's been written in the last 30 or 40 years. Because Mead's reputation has gone up quite a bit in the last 40, 50 years. I mean, it's never going to be genius level or anything like that, given his career and other stuff. But people definitely have a more positive view of Mead than they used to. And he really was bringing back the whole idea of like, nah, Mead was just a slow, incompetent snapping turtle. At least that's what I've been told. So... I don't have much of an opinion on that one, but I feel like there was one other super chat before that. Well, there's one. one right after it by uh, oh, right after that's what it is. Diagenes. Diagenes dollars. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Hey y'all. Um, how the fuck? How the fuck? Sorry, <laughs> did I ask for a call-in stream and barely participate in it? Also, y'all's thoughts on the Time article that shows how they stole the election or fortified. Um, uh, do you know what he's talking about? This was my first exposure to this. I pulled it up on my browser. I'm not going to have time to read it right now. So I have to look into that. I don't know. I I, I have not read it myself yet. I, I do know they're essentially saying, and they use the word cabal, literally, which I'm like, wow, you're using cabal in this article, huh? Of certain people in the background, such as labor leaders, business leaders, and Silicon Valley, to do things to make sure that Trump did not win, essentially, which, to which I'm like, times telling you that it, that gravity is a thing, and the moon circles the Earth. I mean, you have to be a blind man not to have seen that, that was going on. Uh, that does not necessarily mean stolen election, but um, what that would entail is that these people know they have considerable influence; they're not stupid, and they want to use that influence to make sure that Donald J. Trump for various reasons, was not president. You know, um, I think all that probably just showed you, uh, in my opinion, was the, the depth of dislike for Trump, which the reasons for that are multifaceted, of course, which we, me and you have mentioned. Um, you know, so I, I mean, I, I ultimately think like it really, I sort of think the main reason why is that um, they don't want an ugly face on American power. They want a pretty face. They want an acceptable face. Hmm. You know, they they don't want a president who says, I don't care about Libya unless we get oil. Now, we all know that's the only reason we're going to we'd ever go to Libya, really. That's the main reason we'd go. Right. But we don't want to hear that. We want to hear about democracy and freedom. You know, we don't want to hear somebody saying, yeah, we're just there to get the gas. Now, I do. but I'm a fan of the road warrior. OK, so just want to get the gas. Right. <laughs> but anyway, so that was just my take on it. I. I I don't think that shows something like, um, from what I read of it, doesn't show something like thievery. Just they're being very blunt about, hey, guys, we influenced the election to make sure this guy lost. And honestly, these people have been using influence for a while. I guess what was probably disturbing with this one is them being brazen about it, the degree of coordination, and also the pervasiveness of it. We are kind of used to the idea that when you have two people running for president, your elites are going to be divided between who they're backing. Yeah. And we just didn't get that with this election. And I don't know. I mean, how many of the presidential elections was it that lopsided? William Jennings Bryan? I mean, because he really had no elite backing at all. Probably less than, actually, definitely less than Trump had, I would say. Um, I yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know Franklin Roosevelt you know, pissed off a lot of rich people, but he did have a certain amount of elite backing. Um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, definitely his opponents had more than he had, but he definitely had his share more than Brian for sure. Yeah. But anyway, so you got any thoughts at all? Um, I have not read that article. So, but in terms of in general, a lot of people in the elite, or at least the bulk of the elite being anti-Trump, that has not been a secret. That's been the case since he announced in, what is it, June or July of 2015. So that's not news. <laughs> I, I'll say this one. You know, I'll say who had a really good, some good commentary on this. 
Uh, today I finished Adam Curtis's new documentary and um, called uh, Can't Get You Out of My Head. I don't think it's one of his best ones because I think he might he follows a few too many threads and some of the threads go nowhere. Mm -hmm. But like anything he does, it's worth seeing. It is very good. And he does have his segment on the what he calls the liberal establishment's reaction to Trump. It's like only five or ten minutes of the documentary, but it's spot on. He essentially says that they devolved into conspiracy theories because they don't actually have solutions. So it's easier just to do conspiracy theory, which is one of the threads of the whole thing is why conspiracy theory is so popular. Uh, but anyway, uh, next super chat here. By, Taco uh, Cruiser, yeah. great name. This is a good question. Does Hannibal deserve a pass for the Battle of Zama? Or do you think this was a stain on his legacy, similar to how Gettysburg was for Robert E. Lee? Uh, what do you say? Um, hard to say in this case. So the problem that Hannibal faced at Zama is that while he did have a core of good troops, some of whom were veterans that he had had from Italy, um, the bulk of his force were citizen levies, and he was also massively outnumbered in cavalry. Because remember, well, well we haven't gotten there yet, but eventually we'll talk about how at Zama, the key edge that Scipio had was that pretty much all the Numidians were on the Roman side by this point. And um, so Masinissa, the Numidian leader, had about 6,000 Numidian cavalry. I'm not really sure what Hannibal had on his side, but it was smaller and also of worse quality. And a lot of the victories that Carthage would win would be because of being able to win with cavalry. So the fact that Hannibal made it close, even with a larger but lower quality army, I think does say something positive about him. Now, I think he could have been more creative with what he did with his lower quality troops because he kind of used them American Revolution style, put them out to get their asses kicked and then let them go and then have his veterans close and try to win. So he used them as basically fodder, like a boss in a beat-em-up. Uses their thugs, you know? <laughs> and that's basically what he did with his men. But at the same time, these guys weren't really trained. They didn't know what the fuck they were doing. When they had fought battles, they had just gotten their butts kicked, so... I don't know. Um, I think that the fact that he made it close does show that he knew what he was doing. It's just that ultimately not having Numidian horsemen was his undoing because Masinissa delivered the death blow. Is this, uh, when you say beat him up, is it more Streets of Rage or Final Fight? Both. All beat him ups. That's the final boss will just, uh, you know, when you get to their room or whatever, especially Mr. X in Streets of Rage. He sits on his uh, <laughs> throne and just tells his men, keep going at this guy, so that way when I get up, he'll be nice and worn out, and I'll just finish him off with my tummy gun. Um, yeah, what's the, name of the, what's the name of the final fight gang? Is it, It's Mad Gear. Mad Gear. Yeah, Mad Gear, yeah. Yep, so anyway. All right, uh, back to this. Our next general is Hasdrubal Barca, the younger brother of Hannibal, about two years younger. And he was the man tasked with staying in charge of Spain as Hannibal marched to Italy with his army. So Hasdrubal is effectively the theater commander in Spain continuously from 218 until 207, give or take. Maybe more like 208, because he left after the Battle of Baikala. Okay. So, in many ways, Hasdrubal is the Hannibal of Spain in the sense that his task is the same. He is the main commander there, and he takes over his brother's responsibilities of sending money back to Carthage, so he might be responsible for more of the political management than we're aware of. But for the most part, it's clear that Hannibal was the more senior of the brothers and more in charge. In many ways, if you if you want to understand Hasdrubal, just think of Hannibal, think of his skill set, and imagine someone who has all the same skills, just not as developed. So Hasdrubal can do some diplomacy. He can he can sometimes be an okay tactical commander. He has an okay grasp of strategy. He is okay at recruiting men. But he's not really that good at anything. He's kind of a jack of all trades. But he does have a little bit of skill in everything, which means that he's one of the few people who's actually suited to be a theater commander. 
So, um, one problem that Hasdrubal has is, here's a challenge for you. Can you name any battlefield victories that Hasdrubal has? A battle where Hasdrubal defeated the Roman opponent. Did he defeat Scipio's father? Sort of. Actually, that victory belongs to Mago, the youngest brother of okay. the Barkas. Um, but the one battle he won that we'll get to was more through duplicity and diplomacy. Uh, for the most part, I can't think of any battles he actually won, unless you're talking about putting down some revolts by the Celtiberians. When, when he fought the Romans, he pretty much lost every time. I thought he had one big victory, though, but I guess that's the one you're getting to, right? Yeah, well, the Battle of the Upper Bitus is the one where the two Scipio brothers died, but that one owes a lot more to other people. And also, when Hasdrubal won it, he used his coin purse, not his army, really. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, so his best-known battle is where he fought the Scipio brothers near the Ebro River. I believe the battle was fought at Dertasa. Mm -hmm. he, he tried to recreate Kanai on a one-to-one -one scale, even though he did not possess any real advantages over them in this battle. So Hannibal was able to utilize his terrain. He also had most of the best officers. And while he was at a numerical disadvantage, he kind of knew what the Romans would do. Whereas Hasdrubal is facing Scipio Calvus, who by this point is already a well-known commander who knows what the fuck he's doing. And so Hasdrubal tries to pull off Kanai in front of his face, but does more of the modified version where he tries to overwhelm the flanks. The problem is... Uh, the Scipios know to shore up their cavalry so the Carthaginians don't win there, even though they have the advantage in that arm. And they're outnumbered in infantry, so the Romans smash the center. And then Hasdrubal has to flee with his cavalry and lost all his infantry. So he had an army of maybe 15,000 men going into the battle, and he leaves with a few thousand horsemen. So that was a complete disaster. And that's probably more of a typical outcome when you try to reproduce Kanai. It probably usually backfires horribly. Um, to be fair to him, this was just one year after Kanai, so he was the first person to learn this lesson the hard way. I'm not sure if he tried to recreate it again, but uh, hopefully not. Later on, a couple years later, well, actually, maybe not a couple years later, just the next year, Supposedly, Scipio Calvus was penetrating deep in the Punic territory, according to Livy. It's a little bit unclear if this is true or not. And he inflicted a couple of different defeats on Hasdrubal. Uh, take that for what you will. It does seem a little implausible because of how deep the operations were, but it's possible that Hasdrubal dropped two more battles of Scipio Calvus the next year. In 212, this is where we have the Battle of the Upper Bitus, which is really more of a campaign. And there are about three separate battles involving both Scipio brothers at different points and three different army commanders of the Carthaginians, one of whom is Hasdrubal, who's the commander-in-chief. So he was facing Scipio Calvus one-on-one, -on -one, and this is supposed to be the main battle between the two most senior commanders in the field. And basically the problem Scipio Calvus had is that his army was one-third, he had one-third of the Roman troops and then a bunch of Celtiberian mercs. So, Hasdrubal, as I mentioned, has control of the mines of Spain. So, he's effectively the richest man in Carthage, and possibly in the Mediterranean at this time. So, what he does is he uses his contacts with the leaders of the Celtiberians, and he bribes them. So, they are loyal enough to Scipio Calvus that they won't turn on him, which is what Hasdrubal wants. But they will agree to go home and just abandon him. So he gets all of them to desert en masse. So now Scipio Calvus has a small army and he's exposed. At the same time, Mago Barca and some other guys overwhelm and destroy Publius Scipio. And then they arrive. And now there's a great chase of Scipio Calvus. But the person who made this a success was Masinissa, not uh, Hasdrubal. Anyway, he still, I guess, gets credit because he was the commander-in-chief. So, he's he got also, that. He also, did, he also did the buying off. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, yeah. he's got some strategy, he's got some skills, but uh, 
on a, a strictly military level, he's not that great. He actually reminds me of what you talked about with Braxton Bragg. You know, a guy who can organize men, can train. But, you know, in a battle, he's not that great. Yeah. Or McClellan or, you know, some of these other guys who are good at certain things that they rarely get credit for, but often fail when the lights are brightest. Yeah. So that was the high tide for Hezrubal. Um Interesting side note, when he was defeated in 215 at Dertasa, the plan was, according to the Senate in Carthage, to send Hasdrubal to Italy already. So actually the great plan all along that took almost 10 years to complete was to get Hasdrubal and his army to Italy. So Dertasa, one of the main significances of the battle is that it prevented him from getting there. And he had to stay in Spain. He also had to request a new commander to come and take his place because they needed a commander-in-chief. Um, this led to... And also the Battle of Dertasa was a big defeat. It led to Mago being sent to Spain rather than to Italy. So Hannibal got doubly deprived of reinforcements due to Dertasa. I, don't, I, I have to emphasize this. Dertasa was a huge fuck-up for the Carthaginians. Okay. So... He now has an opportunity, but the Scipio brothers are dead, and basically Spain now falls to a pro praetor, or just a praetor named Martius. I forgot to cover him in my Roman series, and I'll have to do that in Roman's Renown at some point. Martius has a handful of men who are demoralized, so Hasdrubal now has a chance to invade the Roman part of Spain, right? He doesn't do it, or at least he doesn't do it successfully. He tries and fails. And then... Later, Nero arrives and shores things up, and then Scipio Africanus arrives. So, Hasdrubal had a chance to close out the Romans and failed. So, that's a big mark against him in my book. Um, later on, Scipio arrives, and in 210, marches straight on Cathargo Nova, captures the city, evades all three field armies in uh, Spain. Captures their capital with a lot of their wealth, I think their treasury, all kinds of stuff. And Hasdrubal was not able to do anything about it. Later on, he now tries to go to Italy, but first Scipio finds him and defeats him at Baikala. So Hasdrubal loses a lot of his troops there, has to recruit new men along the way, then goes to Italy. He then fights at the Battle of the Metaurus, and we know how that goes. Before the Metaurus, he apparently won a few skirmishes. But then the reinforcements from Nero's army came and they crushed Hasdrubal in a battle that many people consider to be the decisive battle of the war. So I know a lot of people have said that Hasdrubal is basically the second best general Carthage had because he's the only one they can name. I don't think he's anywhere close to that. This guy is frankly not that good. Uh, yeah, I, I always got the impression that uh, he owed a lot of his position be due to blood, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you think blood. about it, for the commander-in-chief in Spain position, the army there has some loyalty to him, and apparently he seems to have some diplomatic skills, might have had some charisma, but clearly he is not his brother. Wasn't he called the Handsome? No, that was their brother-in-law, Hezrubal the Fair who okay. died uh, in the 220s. Gotcha. So, no, he, I mean, he obviously, he definitely had some talents, but I always felt that he ultimately probably owed his position to being Hannibal's brother, which I don't want to totally denigrate. I think Hannibal wanted somebody back in Spain who he knew wouldn't backstab him. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. And uh, Hasdrubal did represent their interest well. He kept the army in the field, even though his armies kept getting fucked up. Uh, so he, he did have recruiting skills, organizational skills. He just couldn't win battles. <laughs> and again, if we when we remember when we talked about the Scipio brothers and how after Canai they were on a shoestring in Spain. So if you defeat their armies, they're fucked. And he had trouble doing that. When he finally did it, not only was Rome now in a position to send reinforcements, but he also failed to capitalize on closing out their foothold in Spain. And then he left Spain in the hands of his younger brother, tried to reinforce Italy, but the Romans knew they were coming. He took the most obvious and safe route, 
And not surprisingly, the Romans were there to greet him. Things went horribly. I think Hasdrubal at best is a D, but probably closer to an E. What do you think? I was thinking D myself. Yeah. I mean, and again, we have to keep in mind, this was a very hard job that the man had. But he did not do it that well. Not not that I know of anyone who might have done it better, to be honest. But, um, yeah, clearly... What about, what about Gizgo, man? You what? <laughs> what about Gizgo? Uh, sure. I know there are a lot of people named Son of Gizgo on this list, but I don't have any actual Gizgos. You don't? Well, I'll mention it because in Han- the, the fucking great board game, Hannibal, Ro- Hannibal Rome vs. Carthage, Hasdrubal is overrated, and then you have Mago and Gizgo. Oh, oh, Hasdrubal, son of Gizgo. Yeah, he's on this list. All right, yeah, yeah. We well, we were joking about it because there was one game we played where, like, within the two turns, like Hannibal, Hasdrubal, and Mago were all dead, and I was like, well, I guess now it's Gizgo, Rome versus Carthage. Yeah. If somebody can make that work, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, there's that. Um. Now we move on to the third and youngest of the Barca brothers. He seems to have been two years younger than Hasdrubal, so four years younger than Hannibal. Mago Barca. When the war started, he was 25 years old, and he was basically serving as a legate in Hannibal's army. He was one of the key unit commanders in many of the major battles. At the Trebia, he was the guy who led the ambush unit that panicked uh, Longus's men and really produced the great victory there. At, is it Kanai? Yes. At Kanai, he was at his brother's side in the center, which was the hardest place to be. So Mago was responsible for trying to keep the men in line, but also falling back. And Hannibal was there with Mago. Possibly also Maherbal was stationed there as well. So Hannibal had a lot of his top guys doing that job because that was the hardest thing to do. So uh, that's what he was doing there. And he was the guy who then went to Carthage to announce the great victory. And he brought a bunch of those neck rings that the Roman senators would wear. So he had to go debate with the opponents of the Barsids and all that. And he requested reinforcements for Italy. He got that approved. And he was to lead a new army into Italy to help out Hannibal. And then the plan was, then we'll send Hasdrubal in the north, and we'll just have you Barca boys just fuck over Italy and win the war as quickly as possible. As we discussed, the Battle of Dertasa completely fucked that up. So now uh, Mago is in Spain serving under Hasdrubal. And he, if Livy is right about Scipio Calvus's deep dive in 214... He was at Hasdrubal's side while the two of them were getting beaten up by Scipio Calvus. 213, they basically get reinforcements from Masinissa. And then in 212, they fight the Upper Bitus. Mago was the commander-in-chief in the west where they fought against Publius Scipio. So he's responsible for crushing him. And then he was also responsible for, rather than pursuing Publius's survivors, they decided to hurry to where Hasdrubal was to overwhelm Scipio Calvus, and that is what put the Numidians under Masinissa on Calvus's trail and led to his death. So Mago should get a lot of credit there. He um, clearly enforced his brother's strategy with a lot of vigor. Let's see. Later on, um, yeah, I guess he also deserves some some discredit for not destroying Roman Spain when there was that opening, when there were only a few disorganized and demoralized men there. So he could have done more. He didn't. Uh, After Hasdrubal leaves in 208, Mago becomes the new commander-in-chief in in Spain. He does share a lot of authority with Hasdrubal Gizgo, but I think by the way events developed that it's clear that Mago's really the guy. But by this point, he's in a bad spot. Hasdrubal has not done well against Scipio Africanus. As I mentioned, Carthago Nova has been lost. And it's been lost for a couple years. Basically, the only major base they have is the Atlantic port of what was then called Gadir, but what is now Gadez. And then they have okay. some of the mines around that. 
So the resources are greatly reduced, but they still have quite a bit of money, so they're raising mercenaries, but all these mercenary armies are not that great, and they don't have a lot of time to cohere. So Mago is looking for a grand victory in the field to offset things. And I think that there's some evidence that he's a little bit more tactically sound than Hasdrubal, so he feels confident in winning. But again, even if he does have some tactical savvy, the Romans have better armies. And also, if you look at Scipio and his officers, I mean, those that's like a beastly lineup. You not only have Silanus, you have Laelius, Scipio Africanus himself. You have Marcius, who I mentioned earlier, who was also a beast. So, if you're trying to win a decisive battle against a Roman force, this is not the one. Because it's stacked. In terms of officers, and it's also probably the best army the Romans have right now. So, Mago is recruiting men sort of in the north of his position. And the idea is he wants to do two separate battles to keep the Romans divided. Either that or combine and fight one massive one. Scipio's kind of thinking the same thing. But he's afraid that if he crushes Hasdrubal Gizgo too quickly, that Mago will flee. So he sends Silanus after Mago. And Silanus catches Mago off guard. Now, Silanus is outnumbered by a significant number when he fights him in 207. But he crushes Mago. And Mago's chief subordinate who had just arrived from Africa with reinforcements gets captured. So all of those new loyal corps troops are lost immediately. Most of the mercenaries scatter to the winds, and now Mago has to flee back to Hasdrubal Gizgo, and they retreat to Gadir and hole up for the year. And then one of their other subordinates gets beaten somewhere else by Marcius. Mm. So things are fucked in 207. That's a terrible year. 206, Mago goes out, raises a bunch of new men, and then they fight the Battle of Illipa, where he gets connived, literally. Um, he then tries to regroup. He launches a half-baked naval attack against Carthago Nova, which did take Scipio by surprise, but still failed. Then he retreats to the Balearic Islands. He somehow still has money. I guess he took a lot of money with him when he abandoned his base. Um, when he tried to return to Gadir at one point, the locals had shut him out, and even though they were Carthaginian settlers, they just surrendered to Scipio, and they told... Uh, Mago to fuck off, so he had to leave. He then goes to Italy, and he lands among the Gauls, so he lands somewhere near modern Genoa. He stays there for two years, surprisingly. So he lands in 205, and he's there until 203. But he's too weak to really go on the offensive, and the Romans feel a little too weak to go after him directly. He's trying and not really succeeding to raise up the Gauls. He is getting some recruits, but he's not getting a lot of full-throated endorsements. The Gauls just want to be left alone. They want independence, but Mago wants them to get involved. Finally, in 203, the Roman consul Cethegus marches north, and he fights a battle with Mago. I think actually Mago initiated this because he was raiding into Etruria, he was trying to foment a conspiracy among some of the locals there to defect to Carthage. So he's finally becoming a threat. He's got about 20,000 men, and he clashes with the consul Cethegus, or actually proconsul Cethegus, at a place called Insubria. Cethegus has a big advantage in numbers, about 35,000 men to the 20,000 under Mago. Mago is a little bit undermined by the fact that his Gallic allies don't show up in the numbers that they promised. So, this is a tough battle. But Mago is the better general here. So he outgenerals his opponent, he hammers the flank, and then he chooses the exact right moment to commit his elephant, so the first line of Romans gets rolled up, and he's about to follow up on the reserve, but what happens is two different things. First... Mago gets wounded by a javelin and has to fall back. And without his leadership, his army is hopeless. The second factor that happens is that his elephants get driven back by all the javelins. So elephants, if their skin is pierced enough, they're very hard to kill, but they are easy to irritate. So yeah. they were panicking and stampeding. Mago is no longer issuing orders because he's too wounded. His army's routed and destroyed. And we actually don't know what happened to him after that. 
he might have died. He might have stuck around for a while trying to uh, stir things up. He might have gone back to Africa. We don't know. But most likely he died not too long after this. So what do you think and, of Mago, Barca? Um, he seems like uh, he proves that, 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 that line Napoleon had where he said, uh, they asked him, like, what do you want a general? And he said, for them to be lucky. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, we have a man who is not lucky. No. I guess that's true. He's uh, not that lucky. I don't. It's it's hard to rate him. By the time he's really in full independent command in Iberia, he's 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 in a bad spot, and it's not really his fault. Yeah, uh, he's right. Well, fucked. And if you think about, uh, there was no shit Roman general he could go beat up to gain an advantage. Anybody he fought was yeah. going to be top notch. Yeah, he also uh, he also. I mean, he did very well as one of Hannibal's subordinates, naturally. Um, I don't know. It's I, I gotta say, this is one of the hardest ones you've ever, you've ever put up. Yeah, I, mean, I, I almost want to say a C, but he didn't have that much success. But I'm also like, God damn, this is a really hard position this man's in. Yeah, because I'm thinking of the um, totality of his career. Um, so I mean, strategically, I like what he did in northern Italy, even if it wasn't a big success. I don't get the impression that his diplomacy skills were as good as as his brothers. Tactically, he's definitely better than Hasdrubal, but. No Hannibal. Um, I, yeah, I, for me, I, I think he's basically a C. And, and that's also given him a little bit of credit for being such a good wing commander at Trebia and Kanai. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. I mean, it was for me, it was either C or D. Yeah, that's what I have in my notes. I also had the same thing in my notes for Hasdrubal, but as I kept talking about it and thinking about it. I was going more D or E. Um, Alright. Next up is someone who will not take long. And by the way, uh, we've already introduced three names. We're only going to be introducing a few more Punic names. Because almost all of them have the same fucking names. So... Yeah, what, do we have any idea why that is exactly? I don't. I'm sure somebody does. I certainly don't. Um... To be I mean, fair, know, like, the I, Romans also have like six or seven personal names, but they also have surnames, so you can figure it out. This is true. I will say that, uh, I mean, I know like I'm um, reading about French commanders, there's a lot of Jeans and Francois and whatnot, but I mean, it's not nearly as bad as this stuff. Yeah, um, especially when it comes to the Hanos. Uh, the Hanos are super abundant and very confusing, and there's a lot of debate if you go on the military wiki or any site and try to learn about different uh, Carthaginian commanders. And also, even if you look in the indexes of translations of Livy or uh, Polybius, sometimes they don't even try to differentiate these guys. So this is a field where it's very difficult to make progress. And when we're talking about the Hannibal, the Hannos especially, I had to do a lot of guesswork on my own. So a lot of this is speculation in many ways. Because the Greek and Roman authors who wrote about this, they're fascinated by Hannibal, but often they don't really give two shits about some of his subordinates. Um, okay, sir, who's our next one? Our next man is Hannibal Monomachus. Monomachus means one who fights alone, so he is sometimes called the gladiator. But this man is probably a low-ranking Punic nobleman, so... Not a gladiator. Also, gladiatorial games were still fairly new at this time. And also, very much an Italian thing. So, he was not a gladiator. Anyway, based on his name, if I had to guess what his role was, I would say he's probably Hann Hannibal's bodyguard. The only reason I know who this guy is, is because he's mentioned once in Book 9 of Polybius. He's also a good friend of Hannibal, and he's basically just a tent mate, bodyguard, whatever. Before, while they were marching to Italy, he had a dream, and he told Hannibal, "We got to be careful crossing the Alps. The gods told me in a dream that things will get really bad, and we'll have to do cannibalism to survive." Um, that never happened, of course. They did not have to resort to cannibalism. And while it is safe to speculate based on his name that this guy was very good in battle and probably killed some dudes in personal combat, that's the only time he's mentioned in any source. So he is a U. Okay. 
But right. I just like that story, so. I was ready to give him an S because, you know, he sounds like a badass to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess he's one of those guys who's got a reputation, but Polybius doesn't think it's important to really talk about what he did. Uh, he had a dream one time. Um, <laughs> all right, up next. All right, up next we have Bomulkar. So Bomulkar is one of the few people we have on this list who seems to have acted purely as an admiral. Just like the Romans and Greeks, I don't believe the Carthaginians had any hard and fast distinctions between the army and navy. That being said, I don't know of anything that Bomulkar did on land. In 215, he was supposed to be the guy who ferried over Mago's army to Italy. Um, so that didn't happen, but what he did do is ferry over 4,000 Numidian horsemen to Italy where they joined Hannibal's army in 215, which is the only batch reinforcements Hannibal got from Africa during the entire war. Yeah, so, but yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's one of the reasons he's going to lose, of course, but it must also be noted that those are the, if you're going to only get one group of reinforcements, those are the ones you want. Oh, absolutely. So this was a good reinforcement, and I'm sure that this would have been the troop type Hannibal wanted. The Italian infantry he could recruit, the Gauls, the Greeks, whoever else, they were fine. But uh, really the Numidians are the one thing that you cannot buy locally. So he's got that. After this point, um, from 214 to 212, he commands the fleet, trying to contest the Romans around Sicily. Livy's estimates for his fleet range between 60 and 130 ships, so clearly the Carthaginians are building ships again, trying to get their navy battle-worthy. Unfortunately, they decided to entrust it to Bomulkar, which was probably not the best idea. Bomulkar is also trying to aid the Punic army at Syracuse, so we'll get into this later, but Syracuse defects from Rome and joins Carthage in 215. It's a really messy situation that we'll get into when we get to the commanders who went there. But Bomulkar's task was to try to keep them supplied and give them reinforcements. He apparently, other than meeting with the generals, doesn't really accomplish anything. And really doesn't give them any material aid or help them move around men or anything like that. So at Tarentum he does play some role. But this is mostly the result of Hannibal and some of his generals negotiating. So, I guess he has that going for him. He tried to anchor his fleet there, but the locals asked him to leave because he was using too many supplies. They had a food shortage, he had to take his ships out. So yeah, an admiral who is known for being asked to leave. That's a great accomplishment. <laughs> um, Marcellus captured Syracuse. He then tried to retake the city by surprise a couple of different times, but he never achieved surprise, and also his attacks when he launched them failed. So he's basically just sailing around, not accomplishing anything for two years. So unless he has some other deeds that we just don't know about, or there's a textual lacuna in, say, Polybius, where Bomulkar is awesome, he's effectively useless. This guy's just leading around ships for no reason, wasting resources, wasting money paying sailors who aren't accomplishing anything. So, I really have to ask myself the question, WTF, DHD, what the fuck did he do? I mean, maybe he did some stuff that's not really chronicled. I, I know the Romans have a crushing naval advantage in this war. Yeah. You know. I mean, they do... Uh, but at the same time, this guy has a fleet in the, on the seas for a couple years. By this point, they're accustomed to rowing. They've probably gotten some skill, and they should be viable, but they don't do anything. And every time he tries to do something, it miscarries. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, F sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, he's, a, he's an easy F for me. All right, next up is one is the first Hano we'll meet tonight. The first of, I think, four. And this guy, I put in parentheses, army commander in Spain to differentiate him from the other ones. So this Hanno emerges in the late war. So this, this list is not strictly chronological, just in case, so you know. 
this Hano was the guy who was entrusted with a reinforcement army and sent to Spain to help make up for Hasdrubal's departure for Italy. He brought maybe, I don't know, some number of African troops, so including uh, infantry and cavalry, and he reinforced Mago, and together they were trying to recruit Celtiberians. So he is present when Silanus arrived and destroyed them. However, Hanno had the misfortune not only of being defeated here, but he was captured. So his war ended in 207, and he spends the rest of the war as a POW. All his men are lost in their first and only battle, and now Mago can only rely on mercenaries. Um, and because of the Hanno confusion, it's possible that this is one of the Hanos that was with Hannibal early on who helped him win the great victories. We don't know, though. So far as we know, this could have just been some random Carthaginian senator. This could have been the first time he ever committed troops. We don't know. But um, based on his performance, losing a major battle that completely derailed the 207 campaign, depriving Mago of an entire army reinforcements... F. All right. Next up. Next up is a man called Hannibal the Elder. Or, no, excuse me, Hanno the Elder. So the second of, I think, four Hanos, or Hannos, or you pr choose to pronounce it. Uh, once again, very real threat that we are fucking this up because it's very easy to confuse these guys. Wikipedia says that the deeds I'm about to attribute to Hanno the Elder belong to a different Hanno, but I think that Wikipedia is completely fucking wrong on this. Military Wikia agrees with me, and I also read Richard Miles' book on Carthage, where he also says most of the things I'm about to say. So, one of those instances where Wikipedia, despite making a lot of improvements over time, is still still has some flaws. Okay, so in 215 and 214, he was given an independent command in South Italy. This is his emergence. During this time, he most famously fought and lost two major battles against Tiberius and Pronius Gracchus, the guy who raised the slave legions we talked about in the last video on the Roman commanders. However, when he wasn't fighting field battles, he actually seems to have had some talent. That being said, we have to consider the scale of the, vic the battles that he lost. So the first battle at Grumentum, not a huge battle, but still something that helped bolster Rome's morale. It was the biggest victory they won in Italy that year, and it helped to restore Roman confidence. So that's a big victory, even if it's not that big in terms of the number of men killed or whatever. Later, his second defeat at Beneventum, which I don't remember what year that was, somewhere between 214 and 212, probably 212, here, he fought Gracchus again, had 17,000 men going in, lost 15,000 of those men. So, complete fucking annihilation. So, you got to keep that in mind, because now we're going to go through the good things that he did. However, while he was not getting destroyed by Gracchus, he was winning territory in the south where there were no Romans. He managed to capture the city of Locri, which was a fairly major city in South Italy. We're not, we're not sure whether this was through siege work or diplomacy or some combination, but the locals were not eager to defect, so he had to work for it, and he earned the city. He also managed to destroy a pro-Roman force of Lucanians in a battle. So some of the locals rose up and tried to fight on their own against the Carthaginians, and Hanno the Elder was able to defeat them. This was in 213. In 212, before, or maybe it was at some time around Beneventum, he decided, or Hannibal decided that Hanno the Elder would be the guy who would go to Capua and deliver supplies. The garrison at Capua and the locals were getting hungry and were on the verge of surrender. So Hanno the Elder was entrusted with breaking through. And he does surprisingly well. The Romans, by this point, have the north pretty much on lockdown, or I guess technically central Italy. So he slips past his old nemesis Gracchus, who's already crushed him twice, 
and gets to Capua and almost breaks into the city with the supplies. And he fights a pretty desperate battle where he almost overruns a Roman fortification. But a couple of junior officers heroically rally their men, counterattack, and Hanno's army gets pretty mauled. He does escape with his life and the core of his men, however. And in many ways, although this was a failure and a big one, I think this was probably his peak as a commander. Because mm. he did manage to slip past a very good general and almost relieved a siege against an overwhelming force, led by Fulvius Flaccus, who, as we discussed in the last video, was also pretty good. Um, let's see. He now goes to Spain. And he is basically operating as a subordinate here. He is not the same as the Hano who got captured, but he is now in a more junior position under Mago. So after Mago is crushed by Silanus in 207, he's then sent out that same year to recruit more men in a different area, probably up near Portugal. So, you know, closer to the Atlantic coast, hopefully where the Romans won't, won't learn about this. But the Romans do learn about this, so his army, where he has 700 African cav and about 2,000 African infantry, he had managed to recruit 4,000 mercenaries, and all of a sudden, an army under Marcius arrives and catches him by surprise. He's surrounded on a hill and forced to surrender. But while they're negotiating the surrender, one of Marcius's terms is that the mercenaries had to hand over their arms and then go home. But they thought that was an insult to their honor because they're men and warriors. They can't give up their weapons and go home. So mm. Hanno's now forced to fight a battle that he can't win. Half his force gets destroyed. The other half escapes. And that's all we hear of him. We don't know if he dies or what. Um, so yeah, he did, not he did not keep control of his men at this battle. And... I mean, again, it's very difficult to do with mercenaries, especially mercenaries you just hired. So, I don't fault him too much for this. And, for the most part, he does seem to have been an Italian campaign guy who's now thrust into Spain. So, maybe it's not... We shouldn't be too harsh. But, I have him at probably an E or an F. What do you think? Uh, I'd go with an E. Yeah, we can be a little generous to uh, Hanno the Elder. All right. I mean, hey, you know, he ain't he, he sucks, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, he sucks, but he's not completely shit. He's just mostly shit. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Next up is a man who has the nickname in English for some reason of Hasdrubal the Quartermaster. However, if you look at what he actually does for Hannibal, I think it would be probably more accurate to call him Hasdrubal the Engineer. So, this is a guy who's a good organizer and someone who can solve problems. After the Battle of, the Tyke of Tychinus, he's the guy who constructed rafts that could cross the Po River. This enables mm -hmm. them to steal a march on the Romans, who were not expecting them to arrive, so he's in a good position, they're in a good position at the Trebia because of uh, this man's ingenuity and his ability to fashion rafts out of subpar materials. While Fabius was dictator in 217, uh, Hannibal was trapped at one point. So there's the famous story where Hannibal was marching around in the Apennines and got caught by Fabius for a minute. And then he escapes with a daring ruse where he basically unleashed cattle with torches on their heads into the Roman ranks and then escaped while the Romans were distracted. That was all the idea of Hasdrubal. And he's also the guy who figured out how to rig the torches and all that shit. So this was his idea. He's also pretty good at ruses. Fairly multi-talented guy. At Kanai, we know who led the left wing. There is a debate about who led the right wing, but we know who led the left because in both Polybius and Livy... It's none other than Hasdrubal, this guy. 
And the left wing is probably the most overachieving part of the Carthaginian force at Cannae. Because not only did he defeat the Roman cavalry arrayed against him, he then circled around to defeat the other wing's cavalry where the Carthaginians were outnumbered and the fight was actually still ongoing. So he's responsible for beating both wings of Roman cavalry by himself and then freeing up the Numidians to then join him and strike the rear and complete the double envelopment. So he played a huge role at Cannae, and it's clear that he was in on the plan and had to improvise to make sure that it went down. So he deserves a lot of credit there. Uh, let's see. By the way, the guy he routed initially was Varro, and he had a 2-to-1 advantage, so maybe... You know, we don't want to overestimate what he did, but still, it's, it's still fucking Kanai, so. Yeah. All right. Let's see. And, um, interestingly enough, despite having a brilliant career up to that point, he then vanishes from the historical record after Kanai. I don't know where he went. I have no idea. Yeah, it's moments like this that I wish we had Claudius's history, right? Yeah, Claudius or a history that... One of those uh, histories by the Greek historians who were in Hannibal's camp. Yeah. <sighs> so for me... Yeah, you know... Oh, go ahead. No, nah, I was going to say, uh, you know, maybe they'll find some cachet somewhere randomly. That'd be, that'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, All right, so for me, we're basically rating him as a subordinate general, so it's a different criteria... But based on what little there is, I think he's an A or a B. I would say so as well. And also, judging by the fact that he was assisting with the crossing of the Po, he probably assisted, he was also probably part of the crossing of the Rhone River as well, right? Um, that was somebody else we'll get to later. Okay, all right. I mean, he might have figured I, out I, how I, to get I, the elephants across, though, because I'm not sure who did that, but it, based on probability, it was this guy. I, I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's safe to say an A, and besides, um, this list is going to be very bottom-heavy, so let's put somebody on the top, all right? Exactly, yeah, this list is going to be very bottom-heavy. Uh, not only because Carthage lost, but there are some guys on here who are really fucking bad. Uh, actually, there yeah. is one person on this list we'll get to who's represented by Cowbell from Remits of the Three Kingdoms. He's one it, the person after the next one we're about to cover who I think has a good case of being one of the worst military officers in history. Well, damn. Yeah. Uh, we got some we got some Nathaniel Banks, Charles of Lorraine action coming, I see. Oh, wait, um, no, it's a guy represented by John Delaney, excuse me. Oh, yes, I, I, I was wondering who Delaney would who oh, wait, Delaney fuck. was going to be. I might have this. fucked this up a little bit in terms of the images because uh, we'll figure it out, doesn't matter. You know, should we contact the John Delaney fan club and just let them know what we're doing to him right now? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, actually, I, I am missing an image here. I must have forgot to put one in. Okay, one of them got moved to the wrong place. That's okay. So one of you them. You know, though, I mean, if you if you think about it, though, Biden is kind of governing the way Delaney was going to. So I guess Delaney got the last laugh. Just saying. Yeah. Um, no matter what happens, anyway. Delaney always wins. <laughs> no matter what. Uh, Delaney always has sex on the first date. Yeah, uh, well, he probably does actually, because uh, you remember his whole campaign in Iowa. He was clearly getting a lot of attention from age-appropriate women. Actually, yeah, he's probably fucked more women in Iowa than any man alive. No joke. Okay, we should uh, we should get Delaney on here. Have him uh, get get him good and drunk, you know, and um, yeah. Actually, you know what we should do? We should get Delaney on here and do a tier rank, a tier ranking list where he can like tier rank all of his opponents in the primary. Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. Um, I I did want to say though as well that this, this is a very bottom heavy list, and I want this clear. This is not a power bottom. All right? No, yeah, it's not a power bottom. It's, it's the opposite a power of bottom. a power bottom. Yeah. So actually, what I'm uh, thinking, maybe we can do four more and then take a break. Yeah, sure thing. I haven't seen any super chats, but yeah, we can take a quick break. So um, next up, we have another man named Hano. I call him the Northern Spain one because he was the guy 
left in charge of northern Spain while Hannibal was marching to Italy. So this is Spain north of the Ebro, the part that would later become Roman Spain under the Scipio brothers. So again, Hannibal started out with about 60,000 men, and the first major force that he lost is the force that he left under this Hanno in northern Spain, where he left 10,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry. The purpose is to secure his line of communication and hopefully deprive the Romans of an easy opportunity to land in Spain. So Hanno is basically left as a military governor, and he's trying to extend Carthage's control along the, the Mediterranean coast of Spain up to the Pyrenees. This force is fairly small, but he was making some progress. As we know, however, Scipio Calvus arrived. And Scipio Calvus had about twice the number of men available. Hanno saw that Scipio was beginning to win over the locals because the locals hated the Carthaginians. They did not trust them, and the Carthaginians were very exploitative. The Romans were promising that they would be liberators. They had no such intention, but, you know, at this point, the Spaniards don't know them, so why not believe them? Yeah, that's interesting, too. I, I was about to say that doesn't everybody do that, but then I realized, no, nah, no, nah, when, the, when, 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 the, when the Nazis rolled into, into Ukraine, they did not pose as liberators. Yeah, so, uh, but the Romans always pose as liberators. So, anyway, Hanno is outnumbered about two to one because Scipio Calvus has him at two to one in both infantry and cavalry. But Hanno's strategy seems to have been, I need to engage early, try to win a quick victory, and that might stun the Romans and also keep the locals loyal. One thing to keep in mind is that it is possible that Hasdrubal was marching north to reinforce Hanno and that he did not wait for the commander-in-chief. But it's not entirely clear that that's the case. So Hanno engages and loses and loses badly. He loses, I think, 6,000 men killed, 2,000 men captured, including himself, and the other men flee. And of course, this is what gives Scipio Calvus his foothold in Spain. The locals start to submit. He's able to establish a supply base, secure a port for his fleet, and the rest is history. Um, I think that his idea of trying to defeat Scipio early was probably pretty smart. Mm -hmm. But um, clearly he did not have the army to do it. I don't know if I believe the story that Hasdrubal was on the way. But if he was on the way, then that would make him an F for fucking it up. Because in this case, he would basically be Valens Part 2. Or really, Valens Part 0. Because remember, Valens had the, uh, his nephew was on the way, Gratian, and he decided to fight without him and lost the entire Eastern Field Army. So, I'm a little torn on this one for Hanno in northern Spain. I don't know if he's an E or an F. What do you think? Uh, I go with an F. All right. Next up is another naval commander. His name is Himmelko, one of two men on this list named Himmelko. This man is only mentioned by name in Livy. In Polybius, he is simply, he's not mentioned, but it's just mentioned that Hasdrubal has a fleet, and we're not given a name of a commander. In Livy, we learn that he is Hasdrubal's admiral in 218 and 217. As I mentioned when we talked about the Romans, Scipio Calvus won a series of victories upon his arrival, and one of them was over a Carthaginian fleet. He caught the fleet by surprise and destroyed about two-thirds or three-quarters of it. So, um, Himmelko was the commander. Now, Livy has a very vivid account of what happened, and this portrays all of the Carthaginians except for Hasdrubal Barca in a horrible light. And I wish I knew right offhand what passage that was and I'd read it aloud because it's hilariously absurd. But anyways, basically, Himmelko had no idea what he was doing and his men were panicking and they put out to sea as they were getting, uh, as Romans were approaching. But then before they could get out to sea, they realized they wouldn't be able to get out far enough to maneuver. 
so they just panicked and jumped overboard and swam back to shore and watched their ships get carried off. And meanwhile, Hasdrubal is riding on his horse yelling at them to get in the fight, and they're just panicking, and Himilco's not doing anything. So not, he's not mentioning Himilco at all, except that he was the commander, and basically it's implied that he's just watching Hasdrubal try to command. Hmm. But if there's any truth in that whatsoever, I know where I'm leaning in terms of the ranking. <laughs> Go ahead. What you got? It's an F. <laughs> I mean, uh, oh god, poor fucking Carthage, man. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys they were just massively outclassed, and you'll notice that a lot of these guys who are getting in the the low tiers, a lot of them are victims of some of the better Roman generals. So, I mean, the two the two Barca brothers, if it hadn't been for Scipio Africanus, they would be much higher ranked. But Scipio yeah. Africanus and his corps of men really fucked him over. Yeah. <clears throat> Alright, next up is some someone who I think is in the running for worst general ever. Certainly, easily the worst general of this war. Easily. His name is Bostar. And he is basically a garrison commander at the city of Saguntum. Remember the city where Hannibal is laying siege, the Romans then give their ultimatum. He's left in charge at Saguntum. And his job is to not only keep command of the city, but also watch all of the political hostages that Hannibal took. Because Carthage definitely ruled through fear in Spain. They would go to the local tribes, take noble hostages, keep them hostage, and then that was their way of ensuring loyalty. So the threat, of course, is that if you misbehave, we will kill your relatives. Yeah. So Bostar, that's his only job, is keeping these men and women, mostly you know young, very young people and women, under guard. So the Scipio brothers are advancing in, I believe this would have been 215, maybe even a little earlier, maybe 216. I didn't write down the year, unfortunately. But Bostar is worried about his defenses, and then a native Spanish chief named Abelix comes up to him. And it's unclear whether this guy was one of the hostages or just some guy who happened to be in the neighborhood, decided to offer some friendly advice. But Abelix said, Hey, I got an idea. The reason why the Romans are winning right now is because people trust them. The Romans are winning goodwill. So what you need to do Bostar, is show goodwill to the Celtiberians. If you show goodwill towards us, we'll rally to you and we'll know that you're really our champions, not the Romans. And the best way to do it is to release all of the hostages right now freely. And then send them back to their tribes. That way they'll tell about how great and generous the Punic people are. And Bostar, after a couple days of convincing, said, you know what? That's a really good idea. <laughs> so, without consulting Hasdrubal, he does this on his own. And Apolux even convinces him to do this at night secretly for the safety of the hostages. So, he doesn't want the garrison itself to find out, otherwise they might kill the men. And Bostar does not see through what Apolux is doing at all, this whole time. So, he agrees to it. And then, of course, Abelix had been in contact with the Romans the entire time. So he takes all of the hostages out of camp. They don't know where they're going. They enter the Roman camp. And then the Scipio brothers say, We captured you, and now we're setting you free. Here are some gifts. You should go home and tell people about how great Rome is. And that's what happens. So, that's the story of Bastar. And after this, Hasdrubal and other commanders about to spend a lot of time putting down Celtiberian revolts rather than trying to field armies up north against the Romans. So this basically loses the initiative for Carthage until the Battle of the Upper Bitus, after which they lose it again because of Scipio Africanus. So this was a game-changing event that you probably have never heard of that really gave Scipio Calvus and his brother the chance to be on the offensive for most of their campaign. So what do you think of Bostar? Um, I think you've uh, made a good case for, uh, for uh, 
really fucking bad, you know? And it's not so um, much, like, with a lot of these guys we talk about, they're failures and they clearly are not great generals. This guy's a fucking idiot. Straight yeah, up. Yeah, I like... Fucking like, moron. I remember, I remember, like, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, as, uh, the, who was the one who launched the naval attack? I'm, I'm trying to remember. Who was the one who launched the naval attack on uh, New Carthage? Mago? Caught him by surprise. Mago. Yeah, like like Mago, I, I feel like I'm like, okay, I feel bad for this guy in some ways. And somebody like Bommelkar, even, the naval commander, we just don't know a ton about him, so who knows what he might have done in X, Y, or Z position. Right, or, and he didn't lose his or, fleet. You know, but, but, right, but like, I mean, there really is nothing here, man. This is very clearly an F. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the F, most F of Fs I've ever given. I mean, it, I, would, <laughs> I would rather have... I'd rather be saddled with both Voroshilov and Budeni than just have this guy. Great. <laughs> All right. Next up, represented proudly by his fellow bald man, John Delaney, is a man known variously as Hannibal the Bald and Hasdrubal the Bald. It's not clear which was his actual name. Um, Livy calls him Hasdrubal. I believe Plibius called him Hannibal. The only thing they agree on is that the man was bald. So, well, I mean, he may not have been that, too. I mean, like, you know, Baldy Smith in the Civil War wasn't actually bald. Oh, really? Yeah, so maybe yeah, not. He just, maybe maybe he had a full, Maybe the joke was that his hair was deep and thick. I don't know. Maybe he was like Rod Blagojevich. The joke with Baldy Smith is he was simply named Baldy because there were so many Smiths that had to differentiate him. And I think his hair was thin, but he wasn't bald. Ah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. So, we got our Hasdrubal the Bald here. What can you say about Havs, Hasdrubal the Bald? So, uh, Mr. the Bald, in 215, <laughs> he was entrusted with a naval expedition. Originally, someone else was supposed to command it, and the idea was to retake Sardinia. But that mm. commander got sick, so Hannibal the Bald took over. There was a delay. That's part of why he did not arrive when he was supposed to. Uh, he also had he also really had to haggle to get this command taken away from the other guy. So this guy is a social climber of sorts, and he seems to have been an officer in Spain who then was assigned to an African general's command and took it over. So he's kind of a social climber. Anyway, he takes over this force and raises new men in the Balearic Islands and now sails for Sardinia. This was sort of the pet project of the Carthaginian Senate among the people who were not fans of the Barsids. Because Sardinia had actually been the chief area of Carthaginian colonization prior to the First Punic War. There were more Carthaginian settlers there than anywhere else, including Sicily and Spain. So there are still lots of Carthaginian citizens around in Sardinia, and they wanted it back. They had held the island for 300 years before losing it, and Hannibal the Bald was going to be the guy who got it back. Or at least that was what he was determined to be. But a lot of his haggling for the command slowed him down. Okay. He arrives, but by the time he gets there with his 60 ships and his force, uh, the native revolt that he was trying to coordinate with, led by Hampsikara, who we'll talk about if we do a third video on the sort of uh, non-Roman and non-Carthaginian generals, um, Hampsikara's revolt had failed. And the Roman general Torquatus had put it down and defeated the locals by and large. So when he uh, arrives, Tequatu. he's looking... Well, go ahead. I was going to say, no, Torquatus, the hero of the Senate, right? The hero of the Senate who refused to ransom the men from Canai. The hard-ass. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so as I was say, textbook definition of the, of the hard-ass. Yeah, so uh, Hamsikara, despite being defeated, still had a few men... And he was free, so when he met Hannibal the Bald, you can imagine he was not happy about the state of the, court, the Sardinian resistance because there were not as many men as he wanted. But he still tried to fight Torquatus. And they ended up fighting a battle at a place called uh, Desimamanu, or something like that. And this is near the island's capital city of Carolus in the fall of 215. This was a hard-fought battle, despite the fact that there were not as many Sardinians as there should have been. It lasted for four hours, 
but ultimately the Romans managed to carry one of the flanks and rolled up the enemy line. So it was a decisive victory, and Hannibal the Bald was captured along with his second and third in command. Later on, his fleet went home without him, and they too encountered a Roman fleet under Titus Autochelius Crassus and lost several Quinquereims. So it turned into a complete disaster. However, he did try to make the best of a bad situation. And he came reasonably close, given that his allies did not deliver for him. That being said, a lot of the reason they didn't deliver is because he was late, and a lot of that had to do with how he was trying to steal a command, which he eventually did do. Yeah. So what do you think about the bald? Um... He's in the, I mean, some of these generals are just rather unlucky in many ways. I mean, granted, it, it, it was delayed because he had taken so much time to get the command with his angling. But by the time he arrives, the, the rebellion has pretty much been beat up. He's also facing Turquatus. Well, I know it's not like a genius or anything, but one thing you can say about hard asses, um, they're never easy to beat. Yeah. You know? Stubborn, if nothing um, else. So I feel kind of bad for him. But he doesn't strike me. I mean, he's not an F, that's for sure. Right, I agree. Um, like a D or an E, what do you say? Yeah, I'm wavering between D and E. Um, I think I might be willing to be generous here and go with a D. Okay. Because he did come fairly close to winning the battle. So, yeah. Um, so now, do you want to take a short break? And then come back to it? Yeah, sure. I'll be back in about five. All right. Same here. We're about at the midway point anyway, so I feel like this is a pretty good chance. Yeah, but also, I know these I know these last few. I mean, we're done with Hannibal, Hasdrubal. I mean, so it's it's these are just going by real fast, you know? Yeah, there are only a couple more of these guys where I have a lot to say. I mean, so, there, are more, there are a few more people kind of like Hannibal Monomachus where it's... I just found one thing about them I wanted to say. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there are a few of these that will not last long. Anyway, let's hey, take everybody, a... we'll see you on we'll see y'all in about five, all right? See you on the flip side, bitches.
welcome back. All right, I'm. I'm also back. All right, back in black. So uh, we're ready for some more uh, hot Carthaginian action here. Yes, and now we will get to the second and third men named Himmelko. Because oh, great! Like I said, lots of name repetition here. So our next Himmelko came into history in 215. When Hasdrubal was initially ordered by Carthage in late 216 to prepare to march the next year to go to northern Italy, he protested to the Carthaginian Senate, and he said, Guys, there's no one here who can take my place. There's no one here who has the respect of the locals and the connections to do what I do. So I'm willing to go to Italy, but you'll have to send someone who can fill in for me, someone with the authority to represent Carthage and run the whole show. So they dispatched someone named Himmelko. And the idea was that he would he came with a new army, and this new army and new commander would take command of the whole thing. Of course, this uh -huh. plan gets derailed because of Dertasa, so Himmelko never becomes commander-in-chief. And now there's an awkward situation where you have two people who have been designated, but clearly Hasdrubal holds on. And it's not really clear what goes on with this guy. He doesn't really do anything once he does arrive. He doesn't have that big of a force either, so he can't really go to independent operations. The idea was that he would take over the men who were left behind. And I'm not 100% sure, but I think he was later sent to Sicily for a while where he also didn't really do that much. Um, and this huh. is another one of those cases where there's a possibility that this is the same Himmelko who led the fleet, but it's probably not. I don't know. So what do you think of Himmelko, the great commander-in-chief who almost was? Uh, I have no opinion. <laughs> I don't either. I think he's a you. <laughs> All right, man. Well, there we go. <laughs> Unrankable. Next up is uh, yeah. another man named Himmelko. This man was much more junior in rank. He was an auxiliary commander in Spain. At Castulo in the year 206, he was leading some auxiliary forces, and he was actually somewhat acting as a subordinate to a Celtiberian leader named Curdubelis. Curtibellus was the leader of a tribe, I can't remember which one, and his tribe held control of the city. In all likelihood, despite the way that Livy paints it, most likely Himmelko was supposed to be the garrison commander at Castolo, and then Curdubellus uh, or yeah, Curdubellus was the mm -hmm. native leader. At any rate, what ended up happening is that Himmelko was not able to fulfill his duties as garrison commander because Curdubulus surrendered to Scipio Africanus and probably had his men seize all the Carthaginians and hand them over. So that was his role in the war. What do you think of uh, this Hemelco? Uh, nothing. Oh yeah. my god, we're getting to yeah. some... We're getting some real, like, obscure bottom-tier shit here, man. Well, I know, but I mean, I, I, I tried my best to find every Carthaginian commander just to demonstrate how little we actually know. Yeah, I, 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 I knew that we knew little, and it's made even worse by the name repetition, of course. Yeah, um, and again, it's possible that this guy was one of the other previous two guys. I don't know. But uh, actually, right. Olivia makes a point of this guy being fairly junior, so probably not. This is probably a completely different person. All right, so you again. All right, next, yep, so we got another you. Next up, we have a man named Adherbal, the only man of that name in this list. Dude, I, I like him already. He's already, up, he's already up one letter grade for me, okay? All right, well, um, get ready for an epic story about Adherbal. He was a subordinate oh, yeah. officer under Mago Barca in Spain. And Mago discovered that in the Punic port of Cartilla, 
the locals who were Punic settlers were about to make peace with Scipio and defect. So, Adherbal's job was to go there with one Quincurim and eight triremes and keep them loyal, arrest the conspirators, and then take the conspirators back to Carthage for trial. While he's doing that, he's got the conspirators on board, he's about to sail to Africa, he's then intercepted by a similarly small squadron under Gaius Laelius, who was Scipio Africanus' best friend and probably most excellent subordinate of the entire war. Uh, Laelius wins the battle, we're not sure what the casualties were, and Adherbal, even though I think he probably lost his prisoners, decided to go back to Africa anyway. And he left it to one of his random subordinates to go back to Mago to report that they had failed. And that's the whole story. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> okay, this is getting ridiculous. <laughs> I know, but I mean, I, I just find it funny that there's, there's some names that come up and, like, this is all the sources provide on these people. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm guessing he's probably a you. I don't know what else to say about him. I, I, I can't rate him on this basis. I well, I, yeah, he's a U then because, I mean, we can't rank him. I, I mean, you know, let's say we gave him an F. I'd be arguing for an E just because he has a different name. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, all right, I'm, I'm cool with the U for this. And also, I don't know if he still had his prisoners or not because he still had his prisoners. What he did would make sense, right? And he, he would not have been abandoning his duty or whatever. But we don't know because the sources don't tell us. They just say, yeah, then he went to Africa. And then his subordinate had to report what happened. Uh, so pretty vague. Next up is actually a fairly major figure, someone you know about. This would be Hasdrubal, the son of Gizgo. One of the more important generals of the war, even if he is somewhat um, underrated today, or at least underappreciated. Maybe not underrated, but... Um, he was one of the three major army commanders in Spain at this time. So... When we talked about the Battle of the Upper Bitus, there were three field armies. There was Hasdrubal Barca, Mago Barca, and Hasdrubal, son of Gizgo. He remains in Spain, and he is Mago's colleague after Hasdrubal Barca departs. I don't know if he really fights any battles on his own. While he is a major player, it seems that he's always playing second fiddle to Mago. So, most of the time when he's there, Mago or the other Hasdrubal was there too. That being said, I don't know of any times where he really fucked anything up. I mean, I guess to be fair, he was present at the Battle of Illipa, and his army was destroyed, and I think he might have died there too. But, um... No, he didn't. No, no, no he didn't die at Illipa. Oh, he didn't? No, no, I don't think so. Um, no, no, he didn't die at Elipa. He, uh, he, he fought on afterwards. He was, he was involved in, uh, he was, he was heavily involved in Africa in the, uh, in the, um, oh, towards fuck. the end of the war. Yeah, he's, you're right, he's the Az Hazardball who was, tr yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the guy who led the Punic levies out unsuccessfully before they recalled Hannibal. I forgot about that. Yes, I forgot to put that in my notes. Um, so his main claim to fame is actually that. He was one of the few experienced army commanders who was still alive and able to command an army. So Carthage called him up, even though he had failed in Spain. He's given a new army. It's mostly just people who have never served before. They're facing Scipio. He actually does a little better than what I just gave him credit for, so I need to back up a bit. One thing that he did do when he still had the Numidians on his side under King Syphax is he actually forced Scipio at one point to abandon the siege of Utica. So he used cavalry pressure to harass Scipio and make his logistics a problem. So Scipio had to fall back at one point. So that's actually an accomplishment of Hasdrubal. And he was keeping order until he fought the Battle of the Great Plains. At this battle, the Romans triumphed, and rather than pursue Hasdrubal back toward Carthage, Scipio wisely sent some of his men under Gaius Laelius and Massinissa into the heart of Numidia, where they installed Massinissa as the new king, 
killed Syphax, or at least captured him, and then all the Numidians flocked to the Roman side. And after that point, Hasdrubal got relieved in favor of Hannibal, who returned from Italy. But, uh, so there's his record. Uh, yeah, he, um, I don't know. I, I, uh, I generally like him, though. I think he's an underrated commander. He definitely showed skill and organization, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, not like a tactical genius or anything, naturally. Uh, maybe like a D? I was thinking probably a C for him, but I don't know. I'll go with the C. I'll go with the C. Yeah, I mean, he does okay. But again, like, the army he was leading in Africa was kind of second-rate. Um, the armies he was leading in Spain were usually held in reserve while Mago went out. So he didn't have that many opportunities in Spain, really, at least as a commander. A lot of times he was helping Mago clean up messes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel, I, he's the, Actually, of all the guys we've talked about from the Carthaginian side, he'd be the one I'd want to know more about if I could just choose one. Because he's very well positioned, and he seems to be someone who's an ally of the Barshas, but is not in the family. I would like to know more about um, about the uh, Gladiator. Yeah, I'd like to know more about him, too. Also, Bostar. I'd read an entire biography of Bostar. <laughs> I mean, I don't know for sure, but if I had to throw out a hazard a guess, Bostar almost certainly got executed for what he did. If he didn't get executed, he should have. All right. Who's our next guy? Next up is Hanno, son of Bomulkar. Not the same Bomulkar who was the admiral, but a different one, I guess. Anyway, this Hanno, who I believe is our second to last Hanno. So I think we're actually up, we're going to be up to five by the time it's over, right? Yeah, it looks like it. All right, great. So anyway, Hanno, son of Bomulkar. This man is actually a nephew of Hannibal. So Hannibal had three older sisters, and apparently they must have been quite a bit older, because it would appear that Hanno was not much younger than Hannibal. In fact, Hannibal was still only 29 when the war started, so he couldn't have been that much younger if he was already old enough to command troops. Um, he is one of the officers who follows him to Italy. When Hannibal is crossing the Rhone River in Gaul... It was Hanno, son of Bomulkar, who led a small force to a ford and then attacked the enemy in the rear to allow the crossing to take place. So Hannibal trusted his nephew pretty well, and uh, Hanno, despite being the beneficiary of nepotism, was also reasonably skilled. Hanno also commanded the right wing at Cannae with 3,500 Numidian cavalry, although Livy gives that wing to someone else. But most likely it was Hanno, because Polybius in general is to be preferred over Livy, when it comes to military details especially, because Polybius yeah. actually had military experience, and he did meet a number of the sons and grandsons of um, surviving Second Punic War veterans. And also, interestingly enough, Polybius met Masinissa, We'll talk about that later. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Masinissa lived to be very old, so uh, Polybius met him in person. Anyway, um, Hanno's the guy commanding the Numidians. Of course, uh, Hasdrubal came over to help him out. Then they raised hell in the rear and won the great victory. So, confusingly, there are people who think that this Hanno is the guy who was commanding in Italy against... Gracchus. And that's a perfectly reasonable position to take, given that he clearly was trusted by Hannibal, who's in the family, and all of that, and also he gets a lot of chances despite making mistakes. But I personally disagree. And my argument okay. for disagreeing is twofold. One, I trust a lot of what the military wikia does, and two, that was how I had it in my notes originally, and I didn't want to change it. So those are two very solid reasons. <laughs> and I, I feel like those are rock solid. Um, 
Again, perfectly fair interpretation if you think that this is the Hannibal who did all that stuff in South Italy, or South and Central Italy, got defeated by Gracchus twice. I just disagree. I don't know. But again, uh, this is hard. Also, if you want to know how to really get confused about who, which Hanno was which, look up the the index of, say, the World uh, Oxford World Classic Livy, and they'll just list all of the Hanos together as one person. And actually, they, oh, attribute, they attribute to a whole lot of different Hanos the deeds of Bomul, uh, Son of Bomulkar. So it is really fucking hard to tell the Hanos apart. And actually, the people who put together the indices for the translations are some of the biggest culprits. Uh, because a lot of them are linguists and basically don't really do history at all. So, yeah. Let's see. Terrible, man. All right. Um, that, yeah, it happens. Also, I think he got the wrong symbol because I, I think I'm missing another symbol that should be there for him. Damn. We might be one avatar short here. Oh, shit. Yeah, we're one short, so we're not going to be able to put him on the board when we do rank him. Um, so, based on what we do know of him, he seems like a capable subordinate, not quite on the level of Hasdrubal the Engineer. I would rank him as a B. Agreed. So, just imagine a little square icon right here. Because I don't have one to put there. <sighs> Next up, there are two Greek commanders who were basically Syracusan nobles in exile and had been for their entire lives. Their brothers, their names are Hippocrates and Epicides, representing... The General Hippocrates is the Doctor Hippocrates, because as good as I could get. So their grandfather had been banished from Syracuse by the tyrant Agathocles, who was probably the most successful enemy of Carthage that the Greeks ever produced, or at least one of them. He actually led an army to Carthage and threatened it at one point. And since that point, the family had resided at Carthage, and they seem to have accompanied Hannibal into Italy, where they were basically serving as staff officers. In 215, when the new king of Syracuse revolted from Rome and joined Carthage, Hannibal dispatched the two brothers there to take command of the Carthaginian forces, because he knew that they would have the connections to get stuff done. The two brothers were able to easily win over the young ruler, and also, I forgot to mention it, they were there to convince him to revolt in the first place. So they pulled that off. And now they became some of his chief supporters. There's a lot of political turmoil I'm not going to go through. But anyway, there's a lot of twists and turns. Coups, counter-coups. But at the end of it, Syracuse is in the Carthaginian camp. And Hippocrates and Epicides are two of the generals. So... They are elected, and now they're basically accepted back in their homeland. It's all great for them. But now, Roman forces under the general Marcellus are there. And oh, yeah. Marcellus is laying siege to the city. So Hippocrates goes out, and his role is to raise more men and then attack from the outside. While Epicides, the younger brother, will hold the city's defenses itself and wait for his older brother to come to save him. Hippocrates launches a daring assault on Marcellus' field works after Marcellus had pierced the outer defenses, including the fort at Epipoli, which is sort of the key to Syracuse and had been for a couple hundred years by this point. Hippocrates' assault failed and he was killed in action, and with his death, the, the fate of Syracuse was sealed, and as we mentioned, Epicides, well, we didn't mention it, but Epicides is the general who keeps meeting with Bomulkar, the admiral. And they keep trying to come up with plans, but nothing ever happens. Um, Epicides does as well as he can, but ultimately, after his brother dies, and he knows that Bomulkar won't be able to help him in any meaningful way, he just escapes with his men as best he can to Agrigentum, 
And from there, Bomulkar picks him up and takes him back to Africa. And that's his story. So what do you think of the two brothers? Um, I don't really have any uh, particularly special thoughts on the on that pair. Um, the moment you said that Mark, they were facing Marcellus, so I was like, well, this isn't going to end well. Um, but no, I don't have any special thoughts on these guys. I mean, for me, based on what I've read, I rank Hippocrates at a D and Epicides at an E. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Um, Because I feel like Hippocrates did more. He had a bigger role to play early on. He was also, he was a general before uh, the final political dispensation as well. So during all that political turmoil I mentioned, at one point he was sent to Leontini, he took the city, and then their faction, the pro-Carthaginian faction, was overthrown. So he's basically leading the pro-Carthaginian faction in exile for a little bit. Then they come back in the favor, and now the two of them basically take over the city so, effectively, Hippocrates would have become the new tyrant of Syracuse had they succeeded. Because all of the ruling family, except for Archimedes, who didn't want that kind of power, were dead. Wait, was Archimedes even really possible for that kind of power? I mean... He was a relative of the ruling family. Uh, yeah, okay. he was actually... That's why he had so many resources for his experiments. He was cousins with the dictator. Uh, cousins with Hero. Gotcha. So... Anyway, uh, those are those two men. Now let's move on to an officer named Mytones. Actually, I'm going to use his symbol to represent the son of Bomulkar and put him at B. Mytones is much more minor. Uh, Mytones was another officer of Hannibal who was in Italy. He's only mentioned as being there. We don't really know what he did too much. But then, after the fall of Syracuse and the retreat of Epicides, Hannibal takes him out of the staff or out of whatever unit he was in, sends him to Sicily, and he becomes the new commander-in-chief for a short period of time. He was actually achieving some mild success with a cavalry unit somehow, but then it became hopeless, and he eventually negotiated the surrender, and that was his story. He's only mentioned Which one time in Polybius Book 9, and it's just in passing where Polybius explains his circumstance and who he was. Yeah, it would seem to me that it's, if he's uh, he was in Sicily just with cavalry, he was probably just raiding. That's pretty much it. Yeah, so, I mean, he was uh, pretty minor. Apparently, maybe, maybe the deal was Carthage told Hannibal that they needed a new general, and then they'd send reinforcements, but the reinforcements never came. And then he was just there yeah. with a raiding party, and that was it. Anyway, clearly that man's a U. All right. All right a- Next up is one of the power players in Carthage, one of the big names, Hanno the Great. I've been looking forward to this one. All right, so Hanno the Great. One thing I have to talk about first of all, if you look him up on Wikipedia right now, there's a really eccentric theory that the people who did the Wikipedia article took from some French scholars from the 40s who say that there were two men in the Second Punic War named Hanno the Great. The problem with that is our sources don't say that, one, and two, there's no reason to assume that based on context. Hanno the Great was probably very young when the First Punic War ended, but very wealthy, and just like a whole lot of the older Roman senators who served as consul in the 230s and were still alive at the end of the war, he was probably just an old man. There's no reason to think that he must have died at some point and been replaced by his son, although it's possible. But it doesn't really make a difference anyway, because even if there was a changing of the Hanno the Great, the guy's personality, deeds, and policies did not change. That's why I'm convinced it's just one person the whole time. Okay. So... There was a second Hanno the Great, though, who had come much earlier. And that was a Hanno the Great who tried to establish himself as king or dictator back in about 360. But this is a new guy who emerged in the late 240s as the First Punic War was ending. He was one of the guys who convinced the mercenaries to leave Sicily and come back to Africa to get paid. Of course, that went really poorly because Carthage was broke. 
At first, Hanno the Great tried to be the general of the Truceless War. That went very poorly. He got beaten, and that led to the rise of Hamilcar Barca, who had already won some battles before in Sicily. I think if I had to guess that there's probably a correlation between Hanno the Great being shown up by Hamilcar and his later hostility towards all of the Barsons. So I think there was definitely some personal jealousy involved. Anyhow, Hanno the Great was someone who was basically more of a traditionalist, whereas the Barsids seemed to be more, I guess, progressive, for lack of a better term. So in this sense, the Barsids are basically the Scipios of Carthage, and someone like Hanno the Great is more like a Fabius or a Torquatus or a Cato. And he's someone who's very much concerned with the way that things were and the way that things should be in the Republic. Um, he next appears later on when Hannibal takes command of Barsid Spain in 221. When Hasdrubal the Fair took over in 226, he was about the same age as his father-in-law Hamilcar, so you could argue, well, maybe this isn't dynastic. Maybe Spain is not literally controlled by one family. But now that it's a 26-year-old, and he's taking over because he's got all the personal ties and loyalties, at that point it becomes clear that this is a fiefdom. And yeah. Hanno the Great rails against this because he sees this as a threat to the Republic. And he's right, of course. It clearly is oh, a threat yeah. to the Republic. Um... So he is a dedicated enemy of Hannibal from day one. And it's not exactly clear how much he warmed up to Hannibal over the course of the war as Hannibal won battles. He also It's also worth mentioning that although Hanno the Great was the most famous senator, his faction was almost certainly never in the majority. The Barsids were very popular, both in terms of the Senate but especially among the populace. So Hanno the Great had no ability to go to any of the assemblies and convince them to fuck over Hannibal, because there's no way that they would go against Hannibal. Hannibal was their hero. So Hanno the Great had to maneuver within the Senate and the Council of 104. But he did so fairly effectively. The policy he promoted in the interwar years and during the Second Punic War was to focus on Africa, and develop Africa more intensively. And there's a lot of archaeological evidence that shows that despite being in the minority faction, he actually was successful at promoting this. Cultivation in Africa increased, and we see more Punic buildings after the Second Punic War and throughout the next century. So Hanno the Great actually did have a huge impact on Carthaginian politics, and his views eventually did become the majority view after the war was over. But even before that, he was still getting some stuff done. Now, where he impacts the war is in this regard. He's the main guy who wants to make sure that other fronts are getting men. So, if there's a plausible reason to not send men to Hannibal, Hanno the Great is the guy that points it out. That being said, he's not always wrong, necessarily. So, for instance, reclaiming Sardinia. While it does seem on the surface like just a grab for ancestral lands that's a little bit irrational, it actually would be a huge boom for Carthage. Because then they would gain a lot of loyal citizens immediately. Yeah. And they'd have a base Recruiting. nearby. Do go ahead. I was say they get a big recruitment pool since it's so Carthaginian. Yeah, recruitment yeah. pool, tax base, manpower, uh, stra uh, strategically placed land, naval base, I mean shit. You get a lot of stuff there. So if they control Sardinia, if they can raise, say, a thousand men a year and send them to Italy, that's a steady force of reinforcements. That's actually pretty tremendous, considering how little Hannibal had. Uh, or if they had reestablished part of Sicily, even. Those things would have been pretty big. I think it was probably Hanno who pushed for Mago Barca to get sent to Spain. Also, apparently, Hanno the Great mocked Mago when he reported on Canai. Because, really? Yeah, because he pointed out, alright, you got all these rings from dead senators, but why isn't the Senate submitted yet? And why don't you guys march on Rome? Something like that. 
She basically yeah. said, so uh, how you going to end the war? So you won a battle, that's cool, but where do you go from here? Of course, most of the Senate sided with Mago, is pretty clear, but in retrospect, a lot of these historians like to try to paint the conservative figures in a much more positive light, but it's clear at the time nobody took Hanno too seriously in that debate because he lost the vote yeah. massively. Um, Got gotcha. you. Anyhow, I, if I had to guess why he's the great, it's because he was able to achieve things despite being in the minority and to do so continually. Um, yeah, I was kind of wondering where the great, the great comes from in this one, you know? Yeah, but he also does seem to have some sense, so uh, it appears that he was probably one of the guys who urged Hannibal to come back to Italy because he realized, even though he hates the guy, that Hannibal would be the best chance they had of defending the homeland. And remember, he's Africa first, so if Africa's under invasion, their best commander should be in Africa. Yeah. So anyway... Um, he's a little bit hard to rate because he's really more of a politician than a general. I assume he did have some battlefield experience beyond getting his ass kicked in the Truceless War. When they were fighting, say, the local Libyans or Numidians, he probably took the field a few times. By the end of the war, of course, he was way too old to try to take a field command. So he didn't command, and instead they had Hasdrubal, Gizgo, and then Hannibal. Um... That being said, if we're rating him on his effectiveness and his impact on strategy, I think I'd probably give him a C. I'd say so. This He somewhat reminds me of the argument between Louis Montcalm and the governor of Vaudeville in the uh, French and Indian War. And you're know, just keeping it simple. I mean, uh, Montcalm's idea was that they, they had to fight the British in a conventional fashion, so he emphasized fortifications and strong points. And he disdained raiding and, and um, using the indigenous, uh, whereas Vaudeville wanted to use the age-old French strategy of raiding, which, and uh, you know that 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 divide within French strategy is one of the reasons why they lose the French and Indian War. Uh, lately, there's been a lot more criticism of Mount Calm's methods. Uh, I, I I favor Mount Calm's overall because I think Mount Calm correctly deduced that the British were going to send major forces to North America. So the whole raiding strategy wasn't going to work. But I, I just, I mentioned that because, you know, Mount Common and Vaudeville both had very reasonable and understandable strategies. And I feel the same way with Hanno. Hanno's idea of the Africa first strategy is not ridiculous by any means. Yeah. I mean, and, it's not as inspired as Hannibal's idea, but that doesn't make it wrong or bad. Exactly, and while we could say that, hey, like 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 your your contention that Hannibal has to invade Italy, it's the only way. Otherwise, the Romans will wear him down. I mean, maybe not. I mean, I know the Roman invasion of North Africa did not go very well in the First Punic War. Well, that's because uh, they it wasn't well supported, and they didn't send enough men. They didn't recruit enough cavalry. They made a lot of fuck ups in that campaign. Right, but I guess what I'm saying is that. I agree with Hannibal's strategy. I don't think it was the only way. Um, All right. That's and I, I also say that because um, one, one, one negative effect of Hannibal's strategy is that by putting Rome up against the wall the way that he does, it now becomes a fight to the death. You know? Yeah, to an extent. Um yeah, I mean, I, I say if I did that, people are like, well, you know, the Carthage is allowed to exist. I'm like, in much reduced form, and then they got wiped out anyway. I remember one guy said, hey, can we make a third Punic War variant for Hamill Rome versus Carthage? And the, guy, and the other guy in the um, forum just said, oh, yeah, that's good. Just take sandpaper to Carthage. That's the third Punic War. Well, also, it would literally just be the Romans landing and laying siege to Carthage, and then that's the war. Exactly. That's so, what I was trying to say. Like, unless unless you have a detailed map. siege map or something, I don't I don't see the point. Yeah, so I I, uh, I I I don't disregard Hanno. I think Hanno becomes, you know, for those who are going to be partisans for Hannibal, understandably, Hanno is an easy villain, the same way that Lincoln is for I'm sorry that McClellan is for Lincoln or Charles Lee is for George Washington, without understanding that the thing with Lee 
McClellan and Hanno is that they fundamentally want to fight a different kind of war. And that didn't mean they were wrong. We'll never know. That kind of war they wanted to fight wasn't carried out in all right. three of those cases. Right. That's true. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I'd give Hanno at least to see. Yeah, no, I think um, he is someone who is clearly a capable leader. It's also interesting that he left an impact, even though his faction was basically out of power the whole time, or at least only had a you know relatively modest influence. Yet he was still able to get stuff done. Yeah. All right. Uh, All right. Next, okay. next up is probably I would say the third best known Carthaginian commander of the war. Do you want to guess who this is? Uh, Maharbal. Yes, Maharbal. Um, in our sources, at least one of them, they call him a Numidian prince. I don't know if that's the case. His name to me sounds Punic. I don't know, though. His father was named Himilco, so it's possible he was half Punic, half Numidian. Certain, certainly that was a possibility. Anyway, whatever his ethnicity was, it doesn't really matter too much. He often gets associated with the Numidian cavalry. And in popular accounts, he's basically the guy who's with them the whole time. But as we've already discussed, the Numidian cavalry at, say, Kanai was commanded by Hanno son of Bomulkar, not by Maharbal. Maharbal was actually more of a general purpose subordinate officer rather than a specialized unit commander. And as such, he was one of Hannibal's go-to guys to get shit done. It also appears that he and Hannibal were on very good terms and they were close friends. So that's part of why Maharbal was so outspoken with Hannibal, because the two of them have a lot of rapport. At Saguntum in 219, Hannibal temporarily left to go deal with another problem, and Maharbal continued the siege without him. Apparently, Maharbal did such a competent job of replicating Hannibal that some of the soldiers didn't really know Hannibal wasn't there. That's impressive. Yeah. When Hannibal first arrived in Italy, Maharbal's the guy who took out the cavalry to uh, collect forage for the army. The army didn't starve, so I guess he succeeded in that. And he came back from that foraging raid in time to fight at Tychinus, which of course was a Carthaginian victory. At Lake Trasimene, he was the leader of the light infantry who were responsible for the pursuit, so he took most of the prisoners of the men who managed to break out and try to run away. That was a pretty tough job, he did it well. Later on, Hannibal learned that the cavalry of the second Roman army was coming to reinforce Flaminius, so Maharbal took the Numidians and some light troops and then ambushed, captured, and forced the surrender of 4,000 or so Roman cavalry by himself. Based on some of the actions that he took and how often he took prisoners, Maharbal seems to have been a fairly merciful guy, actually. Uh, he's not the kind of guy to commit massacres. He was very much in that Hellenistic tradition of offering quarter and I guess what you might call gentlemanly conduct, even though, of course, it's a little anachronistic, but the idea is that you respect truces and supplication. So if someone says, I swear to the gods, I'll lay down my arms and uh, entrust myself to you, and you'll take care of me, make sure I'm watered and fed. Maharbal would be the kind of guy who would actually take that very seriously. Yeah. More so than most of the commanders in this war, by the way, Roman or Carthaginian. Uh, so I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, so that was probably his greatest feat. Later on, he led the Numidians on a deep raid after the battle and after the follow-up into Latium and Campania, so the region south of Rome. So he actually took his men and kind of did the Jeb Stuart raid, where he left Lee by himself for a while and raised hell. Uh, so Maharbal is the guy who did that in Italy. Um, and interestingly enough, we don't actually know what he did at Kanai. We know he was really? there, though. Okay. Polybius, um, let's see, where, where was I? I lost my place. Okay, so Polybius actually does not mention him at all. 
unless he's talking about the aftermath where he tells Hannibal, you don't know how to use a victory. Appian says he commanded a cavalry unit in reserve. So apparently they had uh, some horses that they were keeping in the very rear in case there was a breakthrough. And in Libby's account, he actually commands one of the wings. The right wing. And he commands that instead of Hano, son of Bomokar. So depending on which account you read, uh, it's not clear at all where he actually was. Well, you know what I would assume then? Uh, he probably started in the reserve and maybe was shifted to the right. Particularly because, uh, wasn't the right wing cavalry the weaker wing, the two? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, that's just an educated guess I would make. Yeah, I mean, my guess would be that maybe he was helping Hannibal and Mago near the center. Uh, because as we discussed, he did command light infantry before, so we know he's multi-talented. He's not just a Numidian uh, commander. And keeping the infantry in line and in order while also retreating is very hard. So I imagine because Maharbal was so good that that's where Hannibal wanted him. So I don't know where in the line he was, but I imagine that's what he was doing. Would he have could could he have done that with cavalry as well? Like like in other words, like you had the line retreating, and then you have cavalry behind them to like pick up stragglers, if you will. I guess I mean that's sort of what Appian seems to be describing. It's possible. Yeah, that, that would be my theory. Then would be that he was doing that, and then at a key moment, Hannibal ordered him to the right. That's, yeah, that could I mean, be. I'm, I'm saying. I'm saying that if, if somebody said you have to make these two accounts work, that's what I would think. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. Maybe he had a, a reserve that launched counterattacks to keep the line and steady. So he had a small cavalry unit he was using to launch little counterattacks to keep the line stable. Something like that, that's possible. But, you know, at any rate, it's clear he was there because after the battle he famously tells Hannibal, you know how to win a victory, you don't know how to use it. Because Hannibal didn't want to go straight to Rome. But um, in modern times, in ancient times, everybody assumed that Maharbal must have been right. And that was true until maybe 100 years ago or so. But now people are thinking about Hannibal losing 10,000 men in the battle and his men being exhausted. Before this, they had only had supplies for a few weeks. So they were probably still a little weak after not really eating that well for an entire year. Um... And also, by the standards of Hellenistic warfare, usually if you suffer that many defeats, the enemy will start to negotiate. But the Romans were not typical of their time. Yeah. So, um, I don't know, I think Maharbal is pretty impressive. The only problem is that after Kanai, he basically disappears. Although, yeah, I wondered about that, given the Numidian defection later on. I wondered about if Amarhabal was involved in that at all. But yeah, so he disappears after Kanai, huh? Although, um, there is an account in the, I think, Roman author Frontinus that talks about a general named Maharbal putting down a revolt of the natives in Africa during the war. So it's possible that he went back to Africa and served there for a little while. And there's also mention of him in the Battle of Castellinum, which is a couple years after Cannae. But we don't really know what happened to him. He just sort of fades away. Yeah, man. And clearly he was not the leader of either the Eastern or Western Numidians. Because we know who those guys were, and neither was Maharbal. So I'm thinking actually he just maybe had a Numidian mother. But he wasn't actually really a prince unless he was the cousin of the prince or something like that. Well, I'd rank him an A myself. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Maharbal was pretty damn good. Next up is Syphax. He was the prince of the Western Numidians. At this time, there were basically two major groups, the Western and Eastern. And... The Western were closer to Carthage geographically and also politically. So Syphax, at the beginning of the war, is a big ally of Carthage, and it's possible that he was a relative of Maharbal. But again, I'm just kind of guessing. We don't really have genealogical charts for this. Syphax probably provided more Numidians than the Eastern princedom. 
Early on in the war, however, Syphax began to flirt with the idea of potentially betraying Carthage and siding with Rome. And this is as early as maybe 213. Actually, maybe even a little before that. He's negotiating directly with the Scipio brothers in Spain. And Carthage gets wind of this, and so they raise up a native army, which if Maherbal did go back to Africa at some point, this might have been it. And also they called upon the eastern Numidians, whose army was led by Masinissa. There were now two battles between the eastern and western Numidians. The eastern forces under Masinissa won twice, and the second time they won pretty overwhelmingly. So Syphax suffered a huge defeat at the hands of a 17-year-old. Twice. <laughs> it was bad. Okay. Well, look, man, I mean, Paul Atreides is only 17 years old when he, you know, essentially conquers the universe by... Defeating the Potash Emperor shot on the fourth, right? True. Uh, but so Syphax is forced to return to the Carthaginian fold because of this. And he bides his time for several years, provides his men, all that. But then in 206, Masinissa comes home and his elderly father dies. So he fights a civil war with his brother. And during that time, Syphax starts to seize lands from him. So, hmm. by the time that Scipio Africanus arrives, Syphax has declared himself king, he's a close ally of Carthage, and he controls most of the Numidians. Also, uh, at one point he was still considering going back to Rome, because uh, he had already tried to defect them once, he had some rapport with Scipio because he had been friends with his uncle and dad, but then Hasdrubal Gizgo approached him, and offered his daughter in marriage. And Syphax accepted, and that kept him loyal. So actually, that was another deed of uh, Giz Hasdrubal Gizgo I forgot about. So anyway, Syphax now gives uh, the Carthaginians a key advantage over the Romans, and as I mentioned, the Numidian swarms are what made it so difficult for Scipio to make forward advances, and he had to actually abandon the siege of Utica in either 204 or 203. At the Battle of the Great Plains, however, Hasdrubal Gizgo and his new son-in-law, Syphax, are defeated, and Syphax flees back to his capital city at Kerta. But then Laelius and Masinissa arrive, and Syphax decides to try to rally his men by launching a counterattack, but in his countercharge he falls from his saddle or something gets wounded and gets captured. And then, so Masinissa just rides up to Kerta, says the Numidians are united and I'm your new king. And they submitted. And at one yeah. stroke, the balance of power shifted massively. And then that's why Scipio ultimately won at Zama. Because now he has the entirety of the Numidian cavalry on his side. I, I'll tell you, I'm having a hard time figuring out what to rank uh, Syphax. I am too. Uh, I'm thinking probably a C or a D. Hmm. Uh, go the D. Yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of his misfortune is just having to fight Masinissa. Uh, whoa, what's wrong with this? Cursor's way off right now. Okay. There we go. So, next up is another Numidian, the final Numidian. And I would argue, aside from Hannibal, the most impressive person on this list. That would be Masinissa. Mm -hmm. Masinissa was a teenager who was the heir apparent to the eastern Numidians. I don't even know if he was the oldest son. In fact, because his father was apparently too old to lead men, and he was only 17, I assume his brother might have been quite a bit older. I don't know, though. For whatever reason, when the Carthaginians called upon his father to lead, Masinissa was sent instead. He crushed Syphax once in a pure cavalry battle, and then followed it up with another victory that was much bigger. He then took this new army to Spain. 
And as we mentioned earlier, he was basically the guy who hunted down both Publius Scipio and Scipio Calvus. So, he was harassing Publius Scipio and about to encircle him, so Publius tried to break out against the Celtiberians, and then Masinissa arrived in time to trap him so he couldn't go anywhere. Mago's force came up, game over. Then, in pursuing Scipio Calvus, he could have gotten away, but the Numidians hounded him every step, and then the infantry caught up too. He got overrun and destroyed. So, Masinissa was the guy who made the Upper Bitus battles so devastating. Later on in Spain, he appears to kind of be a forgotten man, because he's more or less relegated to hit-and-run activity while Hasdrubal, Mago, and Hasdrubal Gizgo do other stuff. So they're doing all the main activities, but it does appear that while his operations are very limited in scope, he does win small successes against Scipio and his allies. These are not things that were worth recording, apparently, but they still mattered. He then goes back to Numidia to fight the Civil War, and Syphax, of course, capitalized. And Masinissa is looking for revenge. But keep in mind, the guy he needs to approach is Scipio Africanus. And Masinissa, more than anyone else, is responsible for the deaths of Scipio's father and uncle. So far yeah. as I can tell, the way that it's worded in the sources, both Polybius and Livy, I think that whatever contact there was between Masinissa and Scipio took place between with uh, Lelius as the go-between. I don't know if they ever actually met in person, really, for any period of time. And I imagine for Scipio, it would have been really hard to meet this guy and, you know, make friends or whatever. So this is probably a pretty frosty command tent once Masinissa did join. Anyway, um, Masinissa took over as king of the Numidians, and this is the formal beginning of the kingdom of Numidia. Before this, Syphax kind of had a pretension to be king, but he had never ruled the whole thing. Now, um, of course, Masinissa does. And after the Battle of Zama, which again, he delivered the key blow at, he remained a loyal ally of Rome for the rest of his life. He lived to be very old. I think he only died around 148 or so as the Third Punic War is going on. So, very old man. And he met the historian Polybius around this time, or maybe a little earlier. And Polybius says that Masinissa was very impressive, very wise, and very kind. Hmm. Anyway, um, Masinissa for the rest of his career, would remain a dedicated enemy of Carthage. Now, most people, when, they, when you ask him, who's the biggest enemy Carthage ever had? They either say Scipio because of his victories, or maybe Cato because he wanted to kill them all. I would argue it's Masinissa. Because this guy understands that anything that the Carthaginians do will be misconstrued by the Romans as an act of aggression and punished. So he constantly egged them on for his entire royal reign. So for 60, basically almost 50, well, over 50 years... He would provoke them and seize territory. And then if the Carthaginians, who were very wealthy, would raise up a big army, he'd call in Rome to back him up. And he did this successfully for years. Maybe, what, 55 years or so as king. And he kept doing this over and over and over. And he kept grabbing different areas of Carthaginian territory. So uh, he was also really good as a king, not just as a general. The Numidian kingdom developed under him. There were cities that started to spring up. It became prosperous. And this is really where Berber culture ultimately came from, is the Numidians. And Masinissa plays Berber. Okay. So Masinissa has a huge role to play in that. Um, also, it's interesting that you know a lot of the, say, black Hebrew people want to claim Hannibal as one of their own, even though he's of Phoenician descent, so he's really more Semitic. Why not claim Masinissa? Because this guy is a legitimate native African. He's also a traitor, though, <laughs> and, a, and a bully. Yeah, but I mean, you know, most of these guys are on some level to somebody, so whatever. I know, I um, know. I mean... I don't know, I mean, Masinissa, um, great king. Also, his grandson was Jugurtha of Juggerthine War fame. Oh, yeah, the one uh, the one I consider um, one of Rome's uh, truly greatest opponents. 
Yeah, and uh, Jugurtha is really the only other great king that Numidia ever produced, and he was not supposed to be king, but he made it anyway. Um, for me, Masinissa is an is an S. Uh, I can see that for sure. And on any other list, I feel like he would be the guy who would be the most impressive overall. Yeah, uh, you know, gotta gotta hang out with Hannibal though. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> yeah, Masinissa, pretty fucking cool. And um, but we're gonna end on a lighter note though. Don't worry, guys. Masinissa proves that treason does pay. Well, as long as you win. I mean, if you win, you can then be a king for 55 years and found a dynasty. But that's the John Harrington uh, little poem, right? Uh, treason doth never prosper, and what's the reason? Because if it prosper, none dare call it treason. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, what was it that Bronn said in Game of Thrones? If you kill a few hundred people, they make you a lord. If you kill a few thousand, they make you a king. Masinissa could have told him that. Yeah. All right. Next up, and finally, is a man named Hannibal Hydus. And All this right. is another guy we don't know much about. He was a political ally of Hanno the Great and a late war senator. His only appearance in our sources is when he appears after the Battle of Zama and he was speaking out against the terms that Rome was asking and saying that Carthage should fight on and try another battle. While he was speaking, Hannibal Barca went on stage, physically grabbed him, and dragged him off the stage. <laughs> and that's his only note in history. You picked a good image for him then. <laughs> yeah. So he's a you. Um, yeah, I guess. And I oh, imagine yeah. this is part of why Hannibal had some serious enemies in Carthage in the 190s who wanted to see him get exiled. Because Hannibal was used to the battlefield, and he was not going to observe the niceties of the Senate. He literally grabbed this man and said, get the fuck off the stage or I will beat you to a pulp. <laughs> so, and Hannibal, by the way, was a very good fighter. He didn't necessarily need the bodyguard Monomachus. I mean, Hannibal always fought in the front lines and killed a lot of people with his own hand. So, if he threatens you, you better be scared. That's true of a lot of these guys. Uh, Julius Caesar, um, Alexander the Great, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying all these guys rush headlong into battle, naturally. Uh, Marcellus is, was another one. I, just that, you, you know, you, you, had, you had a certain level of hand-to-hand -hand combat training, and you were expected, if, if needed, to get into the front lines. Right. You know. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, that concludes the uh, Carthaginian leaders list. This has been a this has been a ball talking about people who we don't know enough about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I some of them, some of them we know a good amount list. about, but some of them we don't know shit about. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, this is one of the frustrations of doing ancient history. So just for some of you who have know who you know maybe have read about it, but maybe haven't really dived deep into it, these are the kinds of issues that you run into when you see obscure names. If you really want to dig deep into a pile, try res research on historians who are mentioned and other historians that we have, but whose works that are mentioned are now lost, and then read about the debates about what they must have said. Now that is some speculative stuff. But also fascinating. Uh, yeah, what is a... Um... I mean, of course, I mean, if you're doing, like, Bronze Age stuff, it gets even chancier, of course. But uh, what is another civilization uh, that you could name, you know, let's say post-Alexander the Great, that you wish we had a lot more on? Because I, I, cause I know Carthage is, our, our, our knowledge is spotty considering how important they are. You know? Yeah, um, can you rephrase that real fast? Well, I mean, what's a civilization post-Alexander the Great that you wish we had more information on? Okay. Um, well, Carthage is obviously one of them. I mean, because we know a fair name, amount, but I think up? that there's more that we don't know than what we know. 
Um, another you? one is the Greco Bactrian Kingdom. Greco-Bactrian. That's one I've always found fascinating that I really wish I knew more about. So Greco Bactrian, and what was the other one? The Carthaginians. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean Carthage. I mean, considering how important they are, it's kind of appalling how little we know. Yeah, um, and uh, a lot of it is just because we don't have any primary sources from them. Although culturally, it appears that they were very much partakers of Greek culture, or they were becoming Hellenized to an extent. Um, we find a lot of Athenian pottery there and Corinthian pottery. And as, as I mentioned, H- Hannibal could speak fluent Greek and could quote Greek p- playwrights, and he surrounded himself with Greek biographers. So he's probably speaking Greek in his camp more than as much as native language, you know? Um... And he was, all, he was very happy to meet Greek visitors. Uh, a, lot, a lot of it with the Carthaginian civilization, they might not have had that deep of a native culture compared with the Greeks or the Romans or some of the others around them. I mean, there might not have really been, say, a Punic poetic tradition or a Punic history tradition. Okay. But, but again, I don't really know. Uh, this is just supposition. And, of course, the Romans didn't really have much of a tradition either until they copied the Greek forms and made them their own. So that could have happened, too, later on in history. Well, uh, you ready to call it a close for the evening? I am. I guess we do need to find a winner, though, for the Super Chat book giveaway. because That's right, because we we had three early on. And and two were tied. It's tied between the... um, Merv, I'm uh, sorry, Nerve AMV Maker and uh, uh, Diogenes. Yes, so we're, there's a two way tie, and we need to determine a winner. And also, the winner will need to decide who they want to receive their book from. Yeah. So, so I don't know how we're going to decide the time. I haven't, I haven't heard from either one of those guys. On the, I've seen them on the chat in a well, while. Well, uh, either one of them will have to break it, or someone else will have to come along and beat $10. There's another gentleman who's already at 5 do so. <laughs> do what? I got I got a tour in the morning, and I just found out it's going to be like 30 degrees over here with rain. Pretty nasty. Yeah, so I would feel bad for you, except... We've already had two or three major snowstorms here, and we're about to have another one tomorrow. And it's supposed to last for nearly a full day. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be... It's it's actually going to get to be like 20 degrees here tomorrow night. Um, that said, uh, you're not working outside, though, are you? Not if I can help it, but every time I have to go somewhere, I have to fucking excavate my car... And oh, uh, hey, hey, hey! I lived up north for for several years, man. I did that several times. I know what you're saying; it does suck. But um, man, like hanging out in the rain for two hours in the cold, I'm not looking forward to it. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, I hate the cold in general. Like I personally, winter is my least favorite month, and it's not I mean, least favorite season. It's not close. Yeah. I just I wish the tours I, I I I kind of these tourists signing up for this one. I mean I'm sort of like, do you really want to do this? <laughs> you know, like this just sounds like pure misery. <laughs> yeah, I mean it does uh, sound pretty whatever, shit. Uh, hopefully they tip well. Well, I mean, yeah, fuck. Hopefully, you know. Uh, but no, nah, man. Let's go ahead. And, let's go ahead and call it a night. I want to, you know. Read some more of this um, Grady McWinnie book I have, and uh, you know, rest up for tomorrow, which is Lundy Gras, but nothing's going on because everything's shut down. You can't even buy alcohol in the French Quarter right now. You can't even buy it in the uh, stores or whatnot. Oh, um, did you write down the people who gave contributions today? Yeah, yeah, I wrote down who it was. Okay, so actually, what we could do, since we don't have a win, a winner is carry over the contributions from tonight till next time so that way no one gets uh you know has their contributions go for naught that's a good idea let's just do that yeah so Diogenes nerve amv maker will be at 10 and then the other guy will be at five 
The guy is Taco Cruiser. Taco which Cruiser. Is a great name. Yeah, so they will have a bit of a head a bit of a head start next time. All right. Mm, All right. Sounds make good sure to I me. So remember, next week, everybody, we're doing the call-in show. You can talk, ask about whatever you want, and we will do our best to respond. And also, you will be able to come in to chat with us live via Discord. And the link to Discord yeah. is in the description section of all my videos. So follow the link at the bottom, and make sure that you're a member. It's fairly easy to figure out. Discord's usually pretty good about linking up with whatever mic you have, if you have just a regular USB mic. So, not too involved, even for somebody who's not much of a tech person like me. So, not too bad. And, um... We'll I see. was gonna say, though, Matt, I didn't realize you hated winter so much. Yeah, I fucking hate winter. I, I, literally, every time I see snowflakes, even if I'm just walking along by myself, I literally say, God damn fucking shit. Like, pretty much every time, I will just, like, have uh, profanity Tourette's. And it almost doesn't even matter what the setting is or who I'm with. <laughs> I hate snow with a passion. I cannot stand it. Because I, snow I, always I turns to ice, things. and it's just this slick bullshit I have to walk over and deal with. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah the, I, I, ice is horrible. That's a pain. Um, my main one here is that as long as it's not raining when it's cold, that that that's pretty miserable. But I do actually like the cold. Uh, I don't know, like around here, I guess spring kind of pisses me off because it's like getting hot, but it's not there yet. And when then when it gets really hot, I mean, it sucks and I hate it. But I'm also kind of like, well, it's here, you know. But like springtime, there'll be a day where you don't need to turn the AC on. Like like one day will be nice, and then the next day will be like 90 degrees, and you're like, fuck, you know. Yeah. yeah, at least at, at least July, August are just a steady 90 degree clip. You know, you know what you're getting every day. There's no surprises. Well, rarely, you know. <laughs> yeah, also it's weird here in Ohio, at least this part of the state. I've noticed the last several years, June and August are hot. July is surprisingly cool. Hmm, okay. I found, I found. I don't know. Well, as I, I when I go elsewhere in summertime, like like it, it's nothing anywhere else to me. Like like I went to like Missouri in August. Like oh, it's gonna be hot and humid. I went there. I was like, this is nothing. This is a joke. I was like, you walk around, barely sweat, you know. But around here, man, summer is rough. But anyway, dude, one I'm gonna time go for the I was, night. Oh, I was, I'm sorry. Go well, ahead, man. It doesn't matter. I, I'll just tell you in a minute after we get off here. Anyway, uh, good night, everybody, and we'll see you next week for the Colin show. I can't wait for it. Have have your whiskeys ready too, okay? Yeah, because we definitely will. <laughs> All right. Good night. Yeah, I, I didn't break anything for this one because I don't know enough about Carthage to get away with that. You know, I'm, I'm stone cold sober, but not next time. Well, I definitely <laughs> wasn't stone cold sober, but that's, I'm glad you were. <laughs> All right.